everyone. Good morning, Foothills County. Welcome to our March 27, 2024 meeting. I'll call it to order at 9.03. Approval of from someone. So all, all in. You do. Oh, okay. Fat back then, Councillor Castell. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Madam Reeve. I think we all got that by email. Um, uh, the reason this is an emergent item is Square Boot Community Hall is undergoing extreme repairs mm -hmm. after the furnace quit and is 45 and uh, everything froze, bur pipes burst. So the president of Square Butte directors contacted me and asked if I would come and view the damage, which is extensive. Um, it's covered by insurance partially uh, through the county, through RMA. What isn't covered is the insurance companies and subtrades discovered all kinds of stuff when they started opening up walls to fix the initial problem, which was... There's significant deficiencies that need to be corrected and the community can't use the hall uh, until these issues are rectified. So while I have everything all opened up and I sent some more pictures today of them, they went on Monday and started doing um, tearing out stuff and this is volunteers did that. So while things are being dealt with from the freeze up, they'd like to be able to deal with them now while the place is all torn apart. Like it's unbelievable. So. Um, I feel it is an emergent and the, the faster that we can make a decision on if council's agreeable to help, uh, they need to do it now while everything's all pulled apart. Thank you. All right. Um, with, uh, I'll, I'll, um, so that's your most emergent item. It is, Madam Reeve. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll ask for the vote. All in favor. Motion carries. We'll add that under F7 um, and just call it Square Butte Hall. Thank you. Anything else? And uh, I was too quick. <laughs> we'll go to you, Councillor Roll, for Thank you. Thank you for that. All in favor. Thank you. Oh. Um, all right, let's start our uh, round table this morning. I'll start with you. Uh... Uh, thank you and good morning, everyone. I have nothing to bring forward at this time. Thank you. All right, Councillor. Thank you and good nothing for Public Works this morning either. All right. Um, for myself, I did have a resident uh, complain about Meridian Street, south of the Meadowbank Hall, saying it needs, I'm not sure it does, but uh, if you wouldn't mind having a look at it. And then uh, on 530th, just uh, west of 64th Street, down in that dip where we're always having trouble where it gets wet, there's quite a good dip in there now. And when you hit it, it's going to might need to do something. I don't know if we can, because there's still some snow there. So I just thought I'd give you a heads up. And that's all I had. On to you, Deputy Reed Walder. Thank you, Madam Chair. And good morning, Fiddles County. Through the chair to manage landfill manager Angevine and team. Really, mm -hmm. really want to say thank you for dealing with a Heritage Point deer carcass last week. Very mm -hmm. timely response. Within a few hours, it was tidied up. And the neighbors really appreciate the, the speediness due to the ever-increasing scavenger activity. So great job. And uh, Madam Chair, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Alger. Thanks, Madam Chair. Good morning to everyone in Foothill. It's all quiet. Thank you. Councillor McHugh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Foothills. It's having a little bit of an Alberta's child's morning, so... Tip of the hat to Ian Tyson, cutting down Gladys Ridge into Mazeppa Flats. And of course, we're all hoping for 18 inches of rain. But um, I would go through the chair to happen to have a snowpack. I'm sorry, I did not at this time, but I can certainly have that for you later in the in the 
Okay, that's all I have for you. Thank you, Councillor Kessler. Big shout out. Uh, Hector Glenn, we had a ton of country, and I think my road was plowed three days um, out of the two weeks we've been off council with uh, other things. Uh, great job because it's unbelievable out there. I'm I'm kind of worried about Monday when it all melts and it's going to be 17 and I I may have a flooded road. We'll see. But uh, thank you to all the crew. All right. Thank you, everyone. We'll go out to our departments. Uh, Deputy Director Glenn. Go ahead. Good morning, Madam or even Council. Just a quick update on a few things. Um, so we're out uh, patching potholes, steaming culverts. We're got a crew in Blackie right now cleaning up the town. The snow, they actually, the further east you go, the more snow there was in the last dump. Um, the bridge file on 64th Street, the tender is out for that. Um, so hopefully there's lot of, lots of interest there. Uh, the pipeline uh, construction um, is well underway and on both sides of the highway. Uh, they should have their third pipe uh, pulled by this weekend, hopefully under the highway. Uh, and the main line from the uh, inlet is just going to wait to back for better weather and then the outlet is um, they're going to start uh, excavating soon on the east side of the highway um, they're going to start installing pipe on the upper bench or down the ditch and across the upper bench uh, sometime maybe Friday and and through the weekend um, yeah that's that's all I had for updates and I do have a an item on the agenda B2 all right, we see that. We'll come back to that for sure. Um, Director Solney. Good morning, Madam Reed. Good morning, Council. I just wanted to touch on uh, the wildfire season. I see there's information coming down from the minister on that. And just give Council an update on some of the initiatives that we've been looking at or, and working on for this year regarding uh, wildfire season and fire smart. Um, during, uh, so th this year, uh, the week of May, it looks like we're going to have an education session uh, with Pretty Screens, and uh, we have two uh, wildfire specialists coming in there, Stu Walk and Sean Rick Arthur are going to take that. And on May 11th, uh, there is a chipping day. Uh, it's, they call it the tent event, which which is really good there, and there's there's going to be uh, Pretty fire, Firefighters attending that one there. Uh, last... Uh, Sunday, the 24th, the Alderwood community, uh, we had representatives out there from the fire department uh, doing uh, a new program, which is called uh, Wildfire Ready. That's kind of a produced smart program. So we're out there doing that. Uh, uh, we had representatives attending uh, a community fire guard program, which is new from Fire Smart Canada. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, the Foothills County uh, it doesn't really apply to Foothills County. It's more for forestry, the fire guard programs, and there's grant funding for that as well. But we went through the information session there, and it was it was there was some really good stuff taken away from that. Um, we also were uh, went on scout some information on and stuff like that, and, and we go out there and have a chat with them. And uh, six, we actually met with uh, uh, a March 6th meeting a few uh, again many times uh, our residents and with our fire smart and that's all I have thank you we have a couple of algae chair I need to you on 64th is that this that's correct yeah okay now funding for that did we get that um yeah the step funding verse i think carrie might want to comment on that 
Good morning, uh, Council for Health. So uh, the way that budgeted for is hopefully we get the STIP funding. We haven't heard yet. If not, uh, Council had approved going through the LGFF funding. So okay. the, the bridge has to has to be done. Uh, yep. You know, it's uh, the girders keep uh, moving apart on it. So project we can delay. Play. We do get step, but if not, we'll use the other the other funds. Okay, thank. Councilor McHugh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through the Chair to Director Sonia. The you know, Alderwood kind of interest a little bit. I'm not seeing a whole bunch of hazard at all. I'm curious what uh, they were. Um, as far as go, that would go community material or burning grass. Uh, fire guards, because I was out at 10 days. Of course, they have the fire guard. The road. Uh, so, interesting thought on the fire guard. Mention of what they're talking, such as Alderwood. I guess I would. Say, it's, uh, confused Alderwood. That's Seaworks. <laughs> Go ahead. Through the chair to Councilor McHugh. Um, oh, we had a we had a fire go through one of the residents' property over there, and they were contacted by the landowner uh, and asked the landowner asked if we would come out there and stuff like that. How much uh, our smart is a tank an urban interface here, but they are taking some of those concepts since we were actually fire and asked if we. Um, events in the week. All right. Thank you for that. And we'll go down. Let's deal with 2020 equipment purchase. Uh, manager to come forward. Uh, manager as well. So uh, it's three of our gen ice plant, sir. Who would off on this? I can start it out, Madam Reeve, while Mr. Worf he's getting uh, prepared, and then uh, I can hand over to him if you'd like. Certainly, Certainly. Go, go ahead, ahead please. please. Thank you, Madam Reeve. Good morning, Madam Reeve Council. Um, so before Council today, and that and that to install a new ice plant condenser at the Scott Seaman uh, Sports Rink. And um, we do have it in budget this year. We have 300,000, but also um, we have this item included in the MCCAC uh, grant application that uh, has gone back for review and that uh, it came before council a couple weeks ago in regards to the solar panels and that the repositioning of solar panels on the the uh, facility as well as uh, some new and that uh, technologies and that uh, to replace some of the older uh, items in the arena. So what we're looking for from council today and that um, is basically approval and that for this today uh, in principle, uh, the idea I believe will be that we'll wait till the MCCAC um, funding is um, we get a response back in regards to the grant. Um, and then at that point in time, uh, if it's included and eligible for that, we would use those funds. If not, we do have funds budgeted for this. And that. so I guess at this time, I would hand it over to um, our manager Murphy and that to uh, do his presentation for council and answer any technical questions. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Welcome, Manager Murphy. Please go ahead. Good morning, Madam Reeve. Good morning, Council in Foothills County. Uh, first off, thank you for the opportunity to speak in person uh, regarding the replacement of our ice plant condenser. 
Um, I'm just going to touch on uh, some background information that was included in the report. Um, and the new ice plant condenser I'm proposing uh, will limit or eliminate service disruptions with great, which greatly affect our valued user groups, uh, programming, and our revenue. Um, when the Scott Seaman Sport Trink of 2013, the ice plant condenser selected was based on site service restrictions, uh, mainly water. Uh, in 2013, there were only two condenser options available, uh, which were the evaporative condenser, uh, which we which we right requires an incredible amount of water to operate and the air cool condenser, which requires no water, which was selected for the facility. Um, since the SSSR opened in 2013, our area has experienced increased outdoor ambient temperatures that render the um, Scott Seaman Sports Rink ice plant non-functional at times. Uh, this situation not only affects our valued user groups, but creates a revenue void of up to $10,000 per week, plus any related repairs and maintenance. And to date, the repair and maintenance costs are in excess of $30,000. Uh, the revenue losses to date are approximately $20,000. Uh, the new ice plant condenser uh, I'm proposing today is new technology and as uh, for the feed, per feedback, sorry, uh, from my peers in the town and the Indus arena, uh, the adiabatic condenser that was installed in both uh, of these facilities has performed very well. And both facilities have reported game changing technology with little to no maintenance costs. Uh, for instance, at the Indus arena, um, which was installed in 2019, uh, to date, they've had a maintenance cost of $250 for a faulty gauge, and, and that's been it. Um, and I'm able to answer any questions uh, Council has at this time. Thank you, Deputy Revolver. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and through the Chair to Manager Murphy and to Manager Porter. Thank you very much for the presentation. Great information. We're in the staff report, it's really being able to operate above 30 degrees Celsius. I gather that this new technology will allow that to be operated in, in uh, maybe warmer weather. Does that mean potential of maybe opening the rink year round, July and August as well? Yes, that is correct, Councillor. Allow us to operate up to 40 degrees Celsius us with our um, historical weather data for the area uh, to operate year round, which would uh, increase our revenue sources. Follow up? If I... yes, Thank you. Revenue sources, my ears perked up and I think a few others. Are there other, other activities or that maybe we haven't experienced or seen in the past? Uh, what that would allow us is to operate year round, um, which includes where our our airing the you for the upcoming uh in the past that's option for our facility due to the fact restrictions to proposed technology uh unless it gets to plus 41 or higher um which hasn't been uh within our historical weather uh make it um, possible to uh, go after those clients. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. Councillor. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Murphy, the, so the proposed company that picking today, it says the offer is valid till tomorrow. What's the timeline? Mr. Porter might have to answer this, but what's the timeline that we're looking to see if we get any grant funding? Do we know? Like from the MCCAC? Um, yep. CAO Payne can speak to that. Go ahead. So that was an item in my updates for council today was the, the energy grant that Mr. Adiega has been working on. He's this week received good news from GICB. They've uh, validated the calculations on energy and GHG savings, as well as the cost analysis. And they're pr now preparing a funding agreement that will come to us 
uh, hopefully would come to council as a next step. So five for council that some dollars allocated in this year for this. Um, however, with the grant under our contribution was a little bit shy of three hundred thousand dollars. So this this condenser would actually um, become our twenty percent share of the overall funding requirement to do the energy saving project. One concern that I did have with proceeding with awarding a contract at this point was that would people under the grant and the grant agreement that and the answer for BC would be eligible does form part of our so they're risk to proceeding so we should still do so councillor sorry councillor seward thank you and thank you to manager murphy just a look here and and what you had said so uh in repairs and maintenance other twenty thousand dollars to date. When you say to date, since twenty thirteen or what time? Not a little bit can last part of that. Dollars in and twenty thousand losses to date. Is that since twenty thirteen? From when? Yes, I this question uh, for Councillor Seward. Yes, that is since the facility is open in 2013 as of today's date. I can $5,000 a year and we're looking at 300000 yeah, no Councillor Seward, our, our internet is in stable here. It's unstable right now, so we're oh. again Just pointing out that we're talk talking five thousand dollars per year. <laughs> when we divide that, add those together, and divide it by the ten years it's been operating, so five thousand per year to, um, and we're going to fix that with a three hundred thousand dollar bill. So I'm just having a hard time understanding how we get to that. Uh, type of a rip of a bill to fix an issue for five thousand dollars. Are you? Uh, I'm not sure. I I'm getting what you're no um, asking, Councillor Seward. Um, but I see my hand up, so maybe he can take a stab at it. Go ahead. Mr. Mamrie, thank you very much. And that, and I'll try. I can hear Councillor Seward loud and clear, so I'll try and reiterate uh, his comments. Okay. Um, Councillor Seward was uh, questioning in regards to um, it comes out to about five thousand dollars a year that of of costs for for answer. And why are we looking at spending three hundred thousand dollars to fix a five thousand dollar a year problem? And uh, through the chair to Councillor Seward and, and the floor. Um, and what we're looking at, and that is this piece of equipment, and that is nearing in that uh, the end of life. Uh, so we're looking at replacing it. We've had numerous complaints from uh, neighbours as well in regards to noise uh, from the current condenser, the, the new condenser that we're proposing. And as well with that, um, the we are going to be recycling the water out of this, so there won't be any loss from the water system. I know that's a concern on the site, so we'll be looking at uh, um, of water as well as being able to bring in that extra revenue. And we're also going to have to replace the current condenser and that. So that was why this was in budget and that. So it was in budget uh, before even the energy savings program came into play. And then once that came into play, uh, we were able to include it uh, with that program. So in overall, it helps municipality and that as far as our contribution as was stated before. So hopefully that uh, answers your question. Thank you. If if I may just follow up. Sure. So 
nearing end of life for that condenser after 10 years. So life expectancy of Dr. Murphy, if you don't mind, and that it is 10 that. years approximately. Is that what we're expecting out of these condensers? Yeah, uh, current condensed is uh, doesn't function to manage reporters. Um, in 2022, we've had to pull the ice early, the condenser couldn't handle the heat, as well as 2023. We had to do the same, pull the ice early, which disrupts our user groups who plan eight to nine week camps. And it's very difficult uh, on them to go back to their clients, families, and community members um, and start issuing refunds based on the fact that uh, we are now a swimming pool instead of a hockey rink. Um, we also have had a late startup in 2020 and last year uh, because of the outdoor ambient heat uh, was too much for our condenser to handle. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, if if we just ran for six months of the year, get uh, more usage out of this current condenser, but the demand on our facility um, is, is 10 months a year, and we would have no problem with 12 months a year if we were to add this new component to our ice plant. Thank you. Um, I'll go on to CAO Payne. Go ahead. Apologies, Madam Reeve. I left my thing up, but I might just comment. Yes, definitely another another element of the calculation that council would likely consider is lost revenue from user groups that aren't able to start as early as they could or go on the current technology that we have there as well, given this condenser has been heavily worked or even overworked in many cases. Um, if that condenser dies on manager Murphy, that would be substantial revenue loss. Um, if you're just looking for some additional financial justification for the recommendation before council today. All right, thank you. I'll go on to you, Councillor McHugh. Uh, thank you, Madam <laughs> Chair, and to the Chair, to uh, Manager Porter, or Mr. Murphy. Um, before, as I understand that, uh, and then there's thrown in the budget uh, for replacement. So on uh, Councillor Seward's question and, and understanding that has been a lemon, uh, what was the life cycle for this condenser and how close are we to the end like goal for that piece of equipment okay i can take this one manager porter um the initial life cycle of this piece of equipment was 20 years based based on a six to eight month operation and we we operate 10 months and and uh, Factors is our outdoor temperature has increased significantly since the facility opened, and it's really, really tough operating. With a little bit of magic uh, to make ice on an annual basis, working in the middle of the night when it's not light out, uh, working uh, extended hours uh, to make it work to be available. Remember, um, you. Thank you, Deputy Revolt. Very much, Madam Chair, and through the Chair to Manager Murphy. Have you done any forecasting on revenue for July and August with the increased activity? Yes, thank you for that, Councillor Walden. Initially, talking to uh, some of our current user groups, um, I, I can safely forecast um, we would generate $50,000 a month uh, for July and August, which is for a total of a hundred thousand, uh, in addition, uh, to what our current revenue is from the ice surface. Thank you. Councillor. Thanks, Thank Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Murphy, the, uh, so I'm looking at terms and conditions again. So major equipment page for when it arrives, all other work will have monthly progress. What, what kind of downtime are we looking or what? 
what kind of time for installation? I mean, like, is this a, when they're talking monthly invoices? Yeah. So thank you, Alger. Uh, so the down payment would be um, ASAP. And and basically, um, I think that's more verbiage they put in every contract. The work would be done in August because there's a 16 to 18 week lead on on manufacturing this uh, specific condenser um, coming out of the states. Um, and we're down uh, typically in July and August as it is. So the hope is to receive the new unit by the end. Have the work done. It's about a two week job and then be ready to fire up on the last Monday in August and be ready for our target date of day, as we always have uh, warm temperatures that restrict us uh, from doing so in the past. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, thanks, thanks for that. that. And just, just one, one more, more if I mean, I'm sure. Um, Mr. Mr. Porter's told to well, the decibel readings is this substantially quieter than the old Thank you for that, Council Elder. Substantially uh, lower. Um, the current condenser has eight fans, and the new condenser only has five. So we've we've eliminated three fans, um, and when you add the water component, it it really quiets it down. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Councilor McHugh. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through the chair to manager Murphy's I uh, guess or manager Porter I guess we've got um you know where we're looking at three different or three sorry substantial price amount just considering the the last one difference in the warranty between these two presentations um for longevity um understanding that the other one was maybe but it would be nice to get uh, what are we going to project 20 years out of this? And is there any warranty from the manufacturer to help us get to that point? Uh, thank you for that, Councillor McHugh. Uh, the life cycle on this current or the proposed condenser would be 20 years. And uh, no support from the manufacturer on that. Um, I think it was a year I saw. Yeah, one one year warranty. Um, All right. Um, anyone prepared to make? Oh, sorry, Man uh, Manager Eva Cambring, go ahead. Uh, yes, yes, Madam Reeve. Uh, just to the. I, 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 yep. So my question uh, for Manager Murphy is uh, the uh, possibility of selling the existing condenser. Is there a, is there a market for it? Uh, I just was looking on uh, Mr. Google here, and it appears uh, that that there is. But uh, are you aware of any? Thank you for the question. Um, part part of the proposal is for uh, StarTech to uh, take away the current condenser. Um, I'm not sure there would be a market for it, um, but I might add, or I would add, uh, it could be a very very heavy boat anchor. That answers that question. I think um, I look for a motion of. Uh sort either way from anyone on council if we're so inclined go ahead deputy reeve Alder. thank you very much for it but uh, seeing as no one has i would be pre prepared to give you the motion to the acquisition of the recommended star tech compressor for the scott seaman sports rink thank you uh we have a motion questions or comments I don't see any, so I'll call the vote. All in favor? Thank you, Mo. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Manager Murphy and uh, Manager Porter. Thank okay, you, Madam Raven Council. Thank you. Let's go on to B2, our 2024 capital purchase. Um, 
We have a road grader and a skid steer, page 30 of our agenda. Go ahead, Deputy Director Glong. Uh, yes, Madam. Um, so council has approved uh, the purchase or the replacement of a uh, uh, the Cayley grader. Um, it has right currently 13,500 hours on it and would it would be well over 14,000 by the time we we got the replacement. Um, so there's uh, two quotes, uh, one from Kat and one from John Deere. And the second item is the skid steer. And council may recall I brought this in in 2023 and had three quotes and was asked to to get some uh, more quotes, uh, which I've done. And we've also um, demoed a couple of the machines. Uh, although the case is uh, deeper, we, you know, it, it didn't really spec out the same as uh, the rest of them. It's got lower horsepower and doesn't have the lifting capacity as the other. Um, so our preference would be the John Deere skid steer. I can answer any council. Yeah. yeah. I sit on the land and um, we are having major issues getting doctor out there. So I know that uh, I'm excited about it and gone to a different. Just wondering her on that and if better off look options. Uh, there are only two the graders and we've tried the John or and it was it, it was not a good I I'm gonna you're going to have issues with all of it, especially with this new emission stuff. Um, I'm just hoping that emission controls get better. And, um, but that is the biggest issue with all of this stuff. And I, I, it doesn't, you know, I think we, the level of set by the, and as far as work and, Finning is is uh, extremely good and there's been not bad, but uh, the other issues. Thank you. Any other two and graders more and more expensive. <laughs> I remember you coming in for under five hundred thousand on them. Um, Councillor Alger, go ahead. Thanks, Madam Chair. Mr. Glant, the, uh, so a couple of weeks ago, you were passing by that 5,000 bucks a year and you, you switch out the unit and switch the tracks and the buckets. And yeah. Did that ever pan out to anything? Well, I just, and I, I sent that out to council just to see if there was, and I said I would do that. And I checked, they don't all offer that type of um, program. I think Councillor all said it best that um, if they're if they're not going to make money off of it, they wouldn't offer it. So yeah, I I don't uh, out there to see if if Council had an appetite for something like that, but I wouldn't recommend. Yeah, yeah but I I was concerned about the tracks because we do a lot of road work that. <laughs> as quick as so every couple of years you're buying tracks anyways right yeah yeah okay thanks for that yeah anyone else uh councillor seward thanks uh, a couple of questions regarding the steer manager gallant uh only 37 trading off for getting rid of what um what's the story on that only that many hours and we're getting rid of it 
it's just not been a good machine uh counselor c word it's uh we're using the skid steers more and more in the in the winter time and and uh it's just it's broke down all the time it's not been a good machine okay and that's pre-emissions stuff too is it not yes yeah yeah okay. um yeah uh attachments attachments are we new to the fleet attachments we're getting i i think i caught attachments so that we room and also a dog that uh uh we can i not as with the subdivisions uh ones along Dunbo Road or in the plannings um, we can load this on one trip sufficient clean up a lot to having to send equipment in that's the I attachments if Sir McHugh. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Director Glant, did we have, um, what do you currently have a deer? No, two cases. Oh, you do have two cases. Yeah. So, this, so the cost of, uh, there is a cost to buy the attachments if you go to if you go to cat well, that's so these prices include all the attachments okay yeah and sorry the, how many hours did these ones have well the uh, the existings 3700 the one that we want to replace is 3700 hours so, so i don't know i yeah. i just have this number in my head but a uh a bob catless Eight thousand hours just sold for twenty two thousand. So I would think you're probably looking at fifty thousand uh, when you sell these two. So that'd be my my guess. But uh, uh, I just throw that out there for council that uh, the resale on these used machines. Uh, it's with tracks and cat and uh, a snot out. Hazardous on pay. If you're working on any sort of sod of any sort, then that's the machine you want because you're not uh, devastating the sod. Any, I don't see any other uh, questions. So um, anyone willing to make a motion to spend some money? <laughs> Put it bluntly. Councillor Alger, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, any further comments? Questions, Councillor McHugh. Sure, is that kind of a blanket motion? What, what's what are we? What's the motion there? Or, it's a motion for the two items. Which two? Award the purchase of the following Finning Canada and Brant tractor price, not to exceed eight hundred and fifty-one thousand six hundred and forty-seven dollars, excluding GST. Oh well, gonna let my resident down. He said we'd spend a million, but we're not quite there. Anyway, what's uh, the refurb cost on a on a grader again, just for compare comparison sakes here? So, so aren't we up to five hundred on a rebuild on the fourteen M? And then maybe what I'll do is I'll send an update to council on the fourteen M that's being uh, rebuilt currently. It's five hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the the rebuild on the fourteen M, and I did look at the a rebuild on the one sixty, um, but it's seventy between seventy seven and eighty percent the full replacement cost. So it just uh, we kind of and that the machines that we are rebuilding are well the the last two were pre emissions, so yeah. But these are all pre-emission machines, and I don't know. I think the last time we discussed this, we felt it wouldn't be feasible. We didn't think we should look at that program for the 160s. 
Yeah. I'm not sure if I may. So but that spreads come down then. The spread between a rebuild and uh, and buying new is not the same as it was. No, uh, actually, it's gone. The spread is, it, yeah, yeah, it's it's closed up a little bit. Yeah, to, to the native. Not I, to the I think it's because it's uh, very. It's becoming very popular. Mm. Like especially with the dozers, they can they can turn one around in six weeks. They claim so. I'm definitely going to be looking at other pieces of equipment in the future. This program, like uh, a uh, scraper, for example, that a 1.4 million, we could rebuild it. Hundred thousand. Yeah. Of uh, um, Councillor Alger, for two items. Any further questions, comments? for the vote all in favor um, opposed councillor seward sorry i didn't see your motion sorry i was trying to find my hand and i'm in favor <laughs> thank, thank you so much um that motion carries thank you thanks thank you uh gentlemen for uh coming in this morning I'm going to move to uh, F6, Foothills Patrol, monthly report, February 2024, page 160. And uh, I'll welcome uh, Odette and Mr. Stapley. Uh, so when you're ready, please uh, be. Good morning, uh, Council. I've been able to present some sort of information to council, so I appreciate your moment. This is a brief report. It's a statistical report from the month. Um, I look forward to being able to open up better communications between our department and what we're doing for residents. And so uh, I won't go through the detailed reports. I hope uh, um, Madam Reeve and council has had an opportunity to have a, have a look at it. Uh, it does show February, uh, typical February, which is um, our winter months are are uh, are a little slower than uh, than our spring and summer months when it comes to our uh, enforcement activities. So, uh, I'd like to present this uh, report to council. Uh, since uh, since February, and now we've had some more somewhat more spring type weather. So uh, all these. Um, uh, requests for uh, enforcement and uh, requests for our priorities in regards to road bans and other things have uh, have shifted away from uh, our bylaw enforcement. So in the month of February, just over half of it was to uh, our responsible dog ownership uh, type enforcement. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, if, if there's any uh, questions from, from council, I'll be willing to take that today. All right, thank you. Any questions from council? Councillor Alger. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Baudet, the so the incident type, so responsible dog ownership, 52.7% or 17%. What what kind of infractions are we talking about? Like is it barking dogs or dark dogs that are loose? Or? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, most of it is... Um, the two, I believe, the two most responsible ones, or the most uh, percentage-wise, is uh, dark barking dogs. Okay. Running at large would be the next, the second one that we would deal with, and then uh, um, dog attacks or dog bites. Um, we haven't didn't have many in the month of February, but in regards to dog bites, but we have some increase in that in this last month. Okay, okay. thanks for that. Any other questions? Uh... Deputy Reeve Waldorf. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and through the chair to our guests this morning. I've actually received a couple of emails thanking Foothills Patrol and Bialoff for the very timely and uh, you know follow-ups, which which has been terrific. I know there were there have been a couple of dog instances, and uh, so a couple of kudos from uh, residents on on uh, your response. It's been really really appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right. I don't see any. So our uh, 
proposed motion is for council to acknowledge the statistical report for information purposes. Anyone willing to provide that? Councillor Castell. I'll give you that motion, Madam Reed. Thank you. We do have a motion from Councillor Castell. I don't see any other uh, comments or questions, so I'll ask for the vote. All in favor? Thank you. Motion carries. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. You as well. Uh, let's continue. Uh, we'll let's try. Well, we've got uh, um, Director Stapley with us. Let's try the F3 Responsible Dog Ownership Bylaw proposed amendments. Uh, go ahead. And that was uh, um, Director Stapley. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Reeve. So through the Reeve to the Council, we've received a request to consider review of the Responsible Dog Ownership Bylaw. Uh, the request is to add an amendment regarding dogs running at large to provide an exemption for working dogs. Um, we are looking today to see if council would uh, propose, make a motion for us to review that bylaw and come back with recommendations on how to amend the bylaw. All, All right. right. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Seaworth, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Reeve. So this really... Um, it has come to light a bit of a, a missing piece in our dog ownership bylaw in that working dogs do um, do roam more than typical other dogs. Um, when you have livestock guardian dogs, their job is to uh, oftentimes circle around the livestock on a quite regular basis and, and protect them from coyotes and wolves, bears, whatever else there might be. Um, sometimes that requires going out on the road and um, perhaps onto the property across the road or or sometimes if a if a landowner has livestock on both sides of the road the dogs might go back and forth um, protecting their livestock but uh, the way our responsible dog ownership bylaw currently is it puts these dogs in a troublesome position because they're not allowed to be um, on the road whatsoever. So this is just looking to make an amendment um, to our, our, our dog ownership bylaw to give provision for these um, uh, livestock guardian dogs. As long as they're working with, with best management practices, it shouldn't be an issue. So um, yeah, just looking for some revisions there. And um, I would be prepared to give you that motion as it's laid out there to direct administration to bring back proposed amendments. Thanks. Right. Thank you, Councillor Seward. Anyone else um, wishing to weigh in on this item? I don't see anyone, so I'll ask for the vote. All in favor? Thank you. That motion carries. Thank you, uh, Director Stapley. All right, I don't see anything else for our department so right at the moment, so we'll continue on with our agenda. Let's look for at municip miscellaneous planning items, D1, uh, Foothills Regional Airport Land Use Project, redesignation DC number five to CR, A and RBD, page 74 of our agenda. Um, Director Hemingway, are you taking this one? Yes, yes. Madam Reeve, thank you and good morning to Council. Council will recall very recently we had a public hearing in order to rezone lands surrounding the airport district back to uh, non-direct control zones. And they're listed here in your staff report of agriculture, country residential, and um, as well, there are lands that will be designated as rural business district. As such, we require that council provide first reading on this bylaw as this, this bylaw did not receive first reading subsequent to the public hearing. So we missed this, this portion of the bylaw. Um, so we do require that council grant first reading on this bylaw. Uh, we will bring it back to second and third once we have uh, both bylaws ready to go, which will be shortly. Uh, so unless council has any questions, <clears throat> excuse me, I would request first reading on this proposed bylaw. All right, anyone have any questions or comments? I don't see any. Um, 
Deputy Reeve Waldorf, go ahead. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Through the Chair to Director Hemingway, thank you so much for that update. And yeah, I guess we missed something. I know we did talk about uh, a number, some of the land as being uh, the abandoned railway line, the abandoned um, natural gas line, etc. So I would be prepared to give you the motion to for first reading as described. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any other comments or questions on this item? I'll ask for the vote. All in favor? Thank you. Motion carries. Um, let's go. Uh, we'll just jump around here a little bit. Uh, miscellaneous municipal items. F1, Foothills Okotoks Recreation Society, joint member appointment, page 155. Um, Manager Porter, are you willing to take this one on? I definitely can, Madam Reeve. Thank you. Um, so before council today, and that um, is a uh, an appointment in that uh, that was made by the Forez and that uh, board and that and recommended to both councils um, on March 7th and that the recommendation was made um, and the motion was made by Councillor Hallmark from the town of Okotoks and he recommended that Tian Renton uh, be uh, appointed as a joint member to serve a two-year term for the Foothills Okotoks Recreation Society. Um, we're looking in that for council's approval on this recommended appointment uh, for the joint member at large for Foothills Okotoks Recreation Society Board. Thank you. Thank you, Manager Porter. Um, any questions on this item? We're just looking for uh, a motion to appoint the member as uh, outlined in page 155. Anyone prepared? Uh, Councillor Seawart, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Madam Reeve. Um, yeah, we have it right there in front of us. This was a bit of a, uh, I guess, a contentious item at our uh, Forez meeting, not not that there was any concerns or Tian. Um, I think the what we see in her resume was was very strong and very encouraging, but the contention was more. Um, so they have already sent a letter accepting her onto the board, and um, they tried to, uh, I guess, hide that there was not just two applicants, but actually three applicants came to light at the end of the day. But uh, I think Tane would be a great addition to the board. So I would um, give you that motion to approve the recommended appointment for the position of the joint member at large. Thank you, Deputy Reeve Thank you very much, Madam Reeve, and through the Reeve to the to the floor. Uh, Councillor Seaworth's was breaking up a little bit and just a little bit more information. I can certainly support the motion. There was some assumptions and some, um, I guess, inconsistent procedures made. Certainly nothing we learned, nothing when there was no malintent uh, directed to this. And uh, it was, I guess, an honest error in terms of the uh, kind of the procedure and contacting and et cetera. So I can certainly support the recommendation for uh, TN Renton as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any other comments, questions? Um, we have a motion from Councillor Seward on this item. If there's no other questions, I'll ask for the vote. All in favor? Thank you, motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Manager Porter. Thank you, Madam Raven Council. All right, let's uh, go on to our next uh, item under miscellaneous planning items D2, Martin, Northeast 21, 21, 29, West of the 4th, Bylaw 65 slash 2023, second and third reading, page 79. Uh, Director Hemingway, go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Reeve. This is a, an application for the creation of a 2.1 acre parcel from uh, a, a parcel in Councillor McHugh's division 
um, as he pointed out to me yesterday, he was not in attendance at the public hearing. Uh, so he will not be providing, um, uh, answering my request for second and third reading on this bylaw this morning. Um, the balance parcels uh, going to be about 52 acres. This is directly adjacent to Highway 2, just south of Highway 552 on 32nd Street uh, to the west of 32nd Street. Uh, all conditions have been met in the creation of this small parcel. Um, we have no concerns and I would like to move this forward for second and third reading, please. All right. Thank you. Um, Councillor Alger. Thanks, Madam Chair. If there's no concerns with staff, I'm happy to give you the motion for second. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Alger gives us second reading. Any further comments? All the vote, all in favor? Thank you. Opposed? Oh, thanks. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and third reading. Anyone prepared for third? Uh, Councillor Castell? Uh, I will give you third on uh, on right. the bylaw. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor Castell. Any other comments, questions? Call the vote. All in favor? Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Uh, D three, Hugh Planche Holdings Limited E. 162128 West of the Fourth, Bylaw 6 slash 20, 2024, second and third reading, page 84. Director Hemingway. Thank you, Madam Reeve. This is an application that is rezoning from direct control six, which is was a uh, a zoning that allowed for uh, extraction of gravel back to agriculture as the lands have been fully reclaimed. Council held a public hearing on this, as well as two other properties or three other properties, my apologies, uh, in the same manner on January 31st, 2024, where Council granted first reading to bylaw 06, 2024. The applicants uh, have completed the requested conditions of uh, first reading of land use. And at this point, I would request second reading. All right, Councillor McHugh. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I've had a long, hard look at this one, and I'm happy to give you a second. I had hoped that uh, between first and second that uh, the uh, landowners and uh, and the applicant would sort things out amongst themselves, but in uh, having another look at this application it is i i didn't uh, the uh concerned letter from the neighboring resident uh we actually do have a trespass situation here uh the meter is not as is pointed out in their letter from the first public hearing on their uh on their property so they can't even check their meter without uh without trespassing so so this is a problem. So I would be looking to adding in a condition at second, and I would like to request uh, impose a condition on this applicant for the execution of a right of way plan and easement agreement for both Fortis to access the power pole and for the access and maintenance of the well, both which serve the adjacent parcel being plan 9811610 block two, the cost of drafting the easement agreement, surveying the right of way and the registration of both are to be borne by the adjacent landowner. Any requirement for the legal fees are to be paid by the by each parties hmm. themselves. Thank you. I, I believe that was a discussion at the hearing and is that not covered in the previous council direction under item one uh, for the new easement for the neighboring landowner? I no, Madam Reed, that was a different neighboring landowner. Okay. Hmm. All right. So we have that as part of your motion, Councillor McHugh, for second reading. Thank you. 
I do you have anything else, Councillor McKee? No? Nothing further done. All right. So we have that motion for second with those amendments. If there's no other comments, I'll ask for the vote. All in favor of second. Thank you. <clears throat> Opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. And third reading on this item. Any? Okay, sure. Thank you for that. So we will halt. Uh, and that will be all the readings we'll provide for today on that item. Thank you, everyone. Let's go to D4, Visser, Southwest 16, 2128 West of the 4th, Bylaw 7, slash 2024, second and third reading, page 92 of our agenda, Director Hemingway. Thank you, Madam Reed. This was one of those parcels that's rezoning from direct control six to, to agriculture district as they have met their reclamation requirements uh, for the gravel extraction. This parcel is actually landlocked and as such did require the uh, execution of the new easement agreement. And this has been completed um, and the county is party to that easement. As such, I would request second and third reading on the land use bylaw rezoning this property. All right, thank you. Councillor McHugh. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess I would just go through the Chair of the Development Authority, the parcel to the south. I'm wondering about the uh, easement that runs north-south. Is that required? Uh, did the, because we did second and third to the south. And so I'm just wondering with their plans, is that easement required? Um, Madam, if I may, mm -hmm. um, they, no, um, they, the, the party to the South had indicated they were not, um, require, requiring that easement as their intention was to come in from 128th street to access that parcel. That makes sense to you. So the parcel directly to the South was, was part of the original easement and, in the hearing when we were talking to the party to the south who had purchased both properties one the 160 adjacent to 128th street and then the one adjacent to the river um, because they had purchased both properties they're going to provide an easement access to that riverside property from 128th street okay so thank you so i so then on the visser property here do we require the north south easement no, and we did, we did not in condition it. We suggested it was available to them should they wish it, but they chose not to proceed. We don't require it. So, so I don't know what to do with that. I guess the easement can still exist. I don't know. I, I'm under the impression that these landowners will discharge that easement and register a new easement. So all properties mm -hmm. will have direct legal, will have access. So this one that council is dealing with today does require an easement over the plant property yep. and they have executed that and we're party to that. And there's an access right of way that makes sense that goes over the existing driveway. So okay. they will register that. Okay. Okay. Property to the South, which is owned by other people um, are registered in a different easement that will provide uh, access to it from 120th street. And they won't be coming in along the river from the highway over the bridge okay uh well i think administration has this under control so i'm happy to give you a second all right thank you councillor McHugh. any further discussion call the vote all in favor thank you motion carries and third anyone prepared to give third on this councillor alger provides third further discussion all in favor Thank you, motion carries on third. Um, council, would you like to take a 10 minute break here? Anyone? All right, let's take a 10 minute break. We've got lots of work ahead of us, so we need a bit of a break. See you back in about five minutes.
Yeah. Welcome back, Foothills County. We'll continue on with our agenda. Uh, D5, Peterson, Southwest 15 2029, uh, west of the 5th, request for consideration regarding access, page 100. Um, not sure who wants to take this, Director Hemingway. Or you I'll start, but they I will need uh, public works. Public works. Yeah. I'm hoping that uh, Vion comes on the screen. Um, because this is this is there he is. a public works issue, and there he is. So, <laughs> council did grant first reading to this application, uh, which proposes the creation of two additional country residential subdistrict A lots from the twelve point eight eight acre parent parcel just south of the town of Okotos. And it's off this little rate, this little road. Um, I think you'll recall this application. It wasn't very long ago, in September of twenty twenty three. Council at that time on public works request imposed a condition that uh, suggested the redesign and construction of the existing cul-de-sac at the east end of 393rd Avenue, as it was a weird offset to cul-de-sac and we we're putting two new approaches off of it. Mm -hmm. Now there's been some work done between the applicant and between our development road technologist. And I think they've come to a very satisfactory solution um, so council, they are looking for uh, council support of that solution. However, there does remain one outstanding issue and that is the alignment of the driveway to the balance. So the applicant uh, and public works have decided that the existing cul-de-sac is quite fine the way it is, it works, that the uh, approaches to the two new lots will be a common approach, but the remaining concern is the alignment of the driveway to the balance as it comes off the cul-de-sac and probably the best drawings to look at in their little best drawings to look at for the difference are um and what the applicant would like to do is on page 115 of your staff report uh, so if you get to one page 15 and look at the alignment of the driveway to the cul-de-sac, you can see it comes off the, it's a steep hill. So it has, it, it has to do that wow on it, but it, it comes off at a, at a weird angle. Um, and public works is not supportive of maintaining that angle. What public works would like is on page 117 of your staff report. And you'll see that they're requesting that the driveway come off the cul-de-sac at a right angle and still maintain that curvature. And I'm going to pass it to Vion uh, to explain anything I've missed there. Uh, thank you. And to the floor, um, all of that is correct. Uh, that last drawing on page 117 is what was sent to us after Deputy Director Gallant and myself met the landowner on site and discussed what the redesign would look like. Uh, we agreed that the cul-de-sac is in place as it is would work with the redesign of the approaches, um, both the proposed and existing. So as you can see, that parcel to the northeast would have a realigned approach with a common approach just south of that. Without doing that realignment, you'd have a common approach for three properties, basically. And to avoid that run straight into that one property, um, there would be a realignment of the approach for the balance parcel. Um, we discussed that that approach where it's illustrated on page 117 could be moved further to the west. Um, this would help also with the grades there. Um, there are some grades to work with, but there, um, as we looked on site, this would be a good solution to that, giving sight distance for everybody entering the cul-de-sac uh, without potential conflicts. Uh, any questions I can try and answer? Sure. Um, so, so what's the applicant uh, feeling on this? You had a chance to speak to him on this and I know he wanted to retain, um, but it was just too steep. So is he amenable to this little curvature at the bottom and the entranceway? He was, he was indicating to me that he needed to have speed in order to get up that hill and this would look like it would probably eliminate that or help with it so uh to the reef the the plan on 117 page 117 was what was agreed upon and then 
we just received another uh, email from them stating they would like to go back and do no changes to any approaches and just build um, no changes to cul-de-sac, no changes to the approaches and just build a common approach. Um, so on 117 was what was agreed and sent to us. Uh, like I said, there Which are ways. Diagram, we've got two there. Um, yeah, and... sorry. Um, the one there is just with air and without air. They're both identical. I oh, believe. okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there is design options for the balance parcel where they can redesign the approach and driveway to work with them um, to give them adequate um, speed, as they say, as they would like uh, to get up the hill. Um, as it is there, he proposed a stop sign. We don't have stop signs on approaches. Mm -hmm. And as per the highway rules of the Road and Traffic Safety Act, you have to stop anyway before entering the road, even though another um, thing is uh, they were stating that they have great visual for the other approaches from their driveway, which they do, leaving. But those approaches do not see, since it's up on the hill to the left, they would have no visual of any vehicles approaching, um, which is a safety concern as well. Um, so there are, like I said, if Deputy Director Gallant is where it's drawn on page 117, that's where Deputy Director Gallant and myself found a suitable location and the like I said the approach could be moved further west too which would even create a, a smoother transition along the contours for the driveway the driveway would have to be realigned um, as well a little bit extended um, but we're willing to there's there's allowance with that balance approach um, anywhere from where it's located there or to the west and is the landowner amenable to this new drawing? No, he's not, Madam Reef. Okay. So my suggestion to him was that if he wanted to retain his driveway, he needed to increase the cul-de-sac bulb and include all three properties. And so um, I'm seeing that he didn't want to do that either. So that was kind of my solution to it. If you want to retain your driveway, then... Um, make the cul-de-sac bulb larger and have it come down into all three properties so that um, everybody has their own uh, approach or even the, the two new lots could do a joint approach. But that would allow him to retain his driveway and if he's not willing to change that, I guess then this is the next best solution for me on this. Um, and this differs from what we had what we had approved, which was on what page? Yeah, one oh two. Okay, they never approved it. They just required we gave the, first reading. You gave first yeah. reading, and you required them to completely redo the cul de sac. Yeah. So Public Works has now suggested that perhaps that isn't necessary. Um, because of the well, the cul-de-sac working the way it is, but their remaining request is to change the alignment of how the driveway meets the cul-de-sac. Okay. Deputy Reed Walder. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and through the chair to the floor. The fact that public works and road technologists have met with the owners, they tried to uh, come up with a solution. I mean, I'm leaning to our, towards our public works and road technologists' expertise and their recommendations in this matter. Yeah, I would, I would concur with that. Um, <clears throat> so on this application, then, uh, our request, I'm just looking for what our, what our motion would be on this. Uh, to, I guess to go with uh, condition one uh, requires applicants uh, applicant to sign county's development agreement first reading with those uh, with the road alignment as suggested by Public Works. Yeah, if council feels that uh, Public Works is on the right track, then my suggestion uh, to council is to make a motion that. Council require the applicant to undertake the construction um, 
as noted by the Public Works Department and as provided in your staff report on page 117. Okay. All right, Councillor McHugh, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I do not believe I was here for this hearing on September the 6th, uh, but I guess I would just quickly inquire. This is an amendment, uh, but I take it that as I was not here, I need to recluse myself from the conversation and voting. All right, yes, I'm seeing um, yeah. Deputy Director or uh, Director Hemingway agreeing. Yeah. All right. Anyone willing to make the motion as we discussed? Thank you, Councillor Roll. Makes the motion for first reading on this. Um, any further comments? Go ahead, Councillor McKee. Well, not a just this is this a first reading or is this this is just uh, approving the, the amendment. Right, with the amendment. It's just a motion of council. Um, just a motion of council indicating their support for uh, the revision, I believe, mm -hmm. for the revision of condition the, one of first. Yeah. So you would like to see the um, revisions as contemplated on page 117 of your agenda package to revise the alignment of the existing driveway to the balance lots. Thank you. And Councillor Ohl, I'm are you amenable to that? Thank you very much. So we have that motion from Councillor Ohl. Any further discussion? All in favor? Thank you. That motion carries everyone. Thank you. Let's go to D6, Cottonwood Golf Course Limited, Southeast 7, 22, 28 west of the 4th, Southwest 8, 22, 28 west of the 4th, Second and third reading, page 118 of our agenda, Director Hemingway. Thank you, Madam Reeve. Uh, I am again requesting second and third reading to the land use district, which rezone the subject parcels from agriculture and country residential district to recreation district with a site-specific amendment. The site-specific amendment as contemplated allows for events, private and special events as a discretionary use. Uh, there was some also some setback relaxations provided. Um, very pleased to be at this point. Uh, the applicants have made a complete development permit application. As such, all conditions have been met, and I would request a second and third reading on the bylaw. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McHugh. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and through the Chair to the Development Officer, I'm just reading the last sentence of 118, so, so just to clarify, uh, all conditions put forth with first reading of this bylaw have been substantially complied with. So <laughs> just wanting to confirm that they they have all been or just a little question about what substantially might imply. They've been complied with. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone willing to provide uh, the motion for second reading on the Cottonwood Golf Course? Councillor McHugh. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I would give you the motion for second reading. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor McHugh gives a second reading. Any further conversation? Call the vote. All in favor? Thank you. Motion carries. And third reading on this item. Deputy Reed Waldorf. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would give you third reading. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? Call the vote. All in favor? Thank you. That motion carries as well. Uh, moving right along, let's go to E, subdivision approving authority. Motion to go into subdivision. Councillor Castell, all in favor? Thank you. Motion carries. Um, E1 Martin Northeast 21 21 29 west of the fourth request for subdivision page 123 director Hemingway. Thank you. Uh, this is a subdivision of a 2.1 acre country residential subdistrict A parcel uh, in Council McHugh's division just south of Highway 552 on the west side of 32nd Street. Um, we have uh, provided you with a suggested list of conditions, including the requirement for municipal reserve on the 2.1 acre parcel. Please note there is a letter from the applicant in your agenda package 
which is requesting that the reserves be deferred to the balanced property. Um, and that's all I have to add. I have no concerns with any of the other components. So I am requesting subdivision approval. And are you suggesting deferring? No. No. I, I, that is not our typical policy. All right. Thank you. Councillor McHugh, are you deferred to the balance? To comment to this? Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess I'd look to rest the council to comment on uh, condition nine. I uh, generally would speak in favor of taking the cash in lieu. So I'll leave it at that and hear from others. Yeah, I would concur with you on that. Anyone else? Anyone willing to provide a motion for subdivision with that, with all conditions? Councillor McHugh. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy to give you the substantial motion for uh, uh, approval, uh, conditions one through 13. All right, thank you so much. Any further comments on the motion? I'll ask for the vote, all in favor? Thank you, motion carries. An E2 Laird Northwest 2228 West of the 4th request for subdivision, page 134, Director Hemingway. Okay, this is a tough one. I hope everybody, it's a, it's a tricky one. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm going to do my best. Back in 1996, council granted first reading to the rezoning of a portion of property in uh, on along the East District to create a Rural Holdings 5 parcel. Second and third reading was granted in 1998. The subdivision was never completed. It was approved, but was never completed. There were a few attempts at uh, revising the subdivision over the decades. However, council most recently had suggested that no, they do not support a time extension to complete all the conditions originally set forth in 1998. So the land use is in place that's why you don't remember this one because you didn't see it in a public hearing. So this is a subdivision uh, coming back from the late 90s. Uh, this is a subdivision also located right on high, Highway 547 at the top of Dropo Hill. It's not on the hill itself. So uh, what is being proposed before council is very slightly different than the land use application, but I wouldn't say enough to be concerned about and because the access is for both the, the proposed and the balanced parcel are from Highway 547, a lot of work has been done with Alberta Transportation. Alberta Transportation has okayed the creation of a new service road, a 30 meter wide service road that you can see on the site plan on page 146, coming off of Highway 547. And that will provide access to the proposed new five acre lot at the east boundary. This will require the relocation of the existing access to the balance to 128th Street. So it, the service road access will be the only access on to 547. Um, I have provided, there are a list of conditions in your staff report. It is quite extensive. I have reviewed it all, them all. I do find it somewhat strange and perhaps if Vion is on the gallery, he might appear that Alberta Transportation has requested the surveying of the entirety of the 30 meter wide service road across the parcel, but doesn't require any actual construction. It can just be a driveway level construction from the highway into the parcel. Um, typically we don't survey land for road unless it's being constructed to our standard. Um, and please understand, and I, I think you probably do, this isn't just an access to the five acre parcel. If you have a map of the area, you have, if you take a look at page 145, you can see that this service road can provide access further south four miles, um, should it eventually go along. You know, people would have to allow for it. People would have to apply for subdivision. They have to be approved for subdivision and the road would be constructed. But I would suggest this could well become a 
an actual municipal road in the future. Um, but that the, but it currently we're not requesting it be constructed to a municipal road. Um, we've also indicated a requirement for proof of water as the proof of water that was done in 98 was not to the provincial water policy and that is in place now. We're requiring the payment of the 11,300 community, community sustainability fee and um, we're pro providing and requiring or requesting an updated municipal reserve calculation for the proposed five acre lot and deferred on the balance. Got yeah. all that? Yes, oh, thank okay. you. <laughs> Deputy Reed Walder, go ahead. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and through the chair to Director Hemingway. A few weeks ago, there was some discussion mm -hmm. and uh, on on some previous road allowances and it was very, very complicated and things should have been done years ago, et cetera, et cetera. Is there any concern with this proposal showing the number of lots on page 145? Is this future proofed? So there won't be any issue with uh, he said, she said, and roads are maybe coming and, and the complications with reserves paid or not? I'm, I'm really not sure what you're asking me, I'm sorry. It, is there any, is there any, like, as I say, a couple of weeks ago, we had, a, you know, there were the two, I can't remember yeah, the exact. A bit different. Time. It's, it's that different? was, yeah, that okay. was on a, a undeveloped road allowance. Yeah. Uh, this one, I believe Alberta Transportation is trying to be yeah. proactive and be put nice. in a, yeah, yeah. put it, in. It, a, it could be that problem. The, the problem when you register, when you survey out a road plan. So if you mm -hmm. take a look at one page, um, 153. You can see their site plan, and this is all from Alberta Transportation and Economic Corridors. They access, they only have to, they only need the top part. They only need that little bit in the north. Yeah. But Alberta Transportation is requesting the survey of the whole right of way to the south boundary. And I don't like roads to be, I haven't, you know, we've, we've, we typically don't survey roads unless they're being developed. Because somebody could just decide that they're gonna access through that. It's public land at that point in time. So my preference would be to register a road, an agreement for acquisition of land for that area and keep it as part of the title of one or the other parcel and um, not register it until council approves a subdivision on the adjacent parcel where which case it can be surveyed and it would be required to be developed as a municipal road with an intersection on highway 547 that's not happening right now so it's not a huge deal it's it's a very small piece of land but i find it quite strange that alberta transportation is suggesting to us where this will be our road not an alberta transportation road that they they, it needs to be fully surveyed out. And I would say that's not their business um, and not our practice. Yeah, it is. I've never seen this before. It is really weird. That's really weird. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'd be in favor of just doing the top portion and not developing the whole thing. But and, yeah, and nobody, nobody wants it developed. They just yeah. want it surveyed out so it's public road. It's like us, it's not a big deal. And maybe I'm overreacting. Um, I'm looking at Harry going, you have to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go to you, Manager Reva Cambrin, and then uh, Councillor Seward. I, I noticed I even signed the bylaw. So, anyway, that Can we the, uh, the situation on a road plan, which this would become, is unless Council accepts the, the road as a public road, it's not a public road that we have to maintain because it's not on a road allowance so that that's the one the one slight benefit uh the uh the other issue though is um if the public became aware for any reason uh, they could access it so uh, because it it would be uh, public land so they could walk on it or uh, even if there isn't a road if it's suitable they could drive on it um so that that could become an issue, but uh, we have a few of these out there. Um, uh, fairly rare, thank goodness. And um, but that's that's the issue here. They will build a driveway probably, 
but say they want to build on the south end of the parcel, uh, you know, you don't want to let them build a hundred meter, hundred meters of uh, driveway down down that road plan. You would want them to build it to a, a county standard, and then we would have to take it over. If they're only going to just dip in on the north corner, that that's a little bit different. Councillor uh, Seward, go ahead. Thanks. So, like, I'm looking at the diagram on page 153. Um, and just further to municipal manager's comments. So, their access comes off the 547 and then right away would turn and go east. Uh, um, would we not normally want their access a little farther away from the intersection of 547? Like, that just seems awfully close. No, I do. That's the only place go to access? Yeah. I, I don't know what you mean. Um, what, you know, people have, some of the subdivision along 128 has done panhandles to mm -hmm. 128 and not come off 547. Um, but, it, you know, if, if, Alberta Transportation okay's the access off 547 or for the service road. I, um, I, I don't know. I don't know where else they get access to to provide you know to create this proposed lot on the east side of this lot of this piece. Again, yeah. I don't know if I understand your question. Manage yeah, no, I'm, I'm more questioning the access onto the proposed lot from the 547 road, road plan. No, not it, the, oh, the oh. close proximity of the access onto the proposed lot in close proximity to the highway 547. Would you not typically come farther south before you would come off of that um, road plan? If I may, I, I think Go ahead, I manager. follow the question. So the uh, when they come off of 547, their approach, the um, and uh, development uh, road technologist uh, Vion Kruger can correct me if I if I'm wrong but uh, they have to come 15 meters south before they can turn into their property so 50 50 feet 50 feet or 15 okay. meters roughly between the intersection and where you're approached from your property so they're basically building two approaches, one off the highway, then they'll come south and they'll turn into their property. But there should be a distance of uh, 15 meters is what our requirement is. So an approach uh, has to be uh, 15 meters south uh, in this case of, of 547. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, center line, property line. Go ahead, um, Councillor Seward. Yeah, so my next question would be, so uh, kind of following up from, from Deputy Reeve Waldorf, so mm -hmm. if we allow them to build this um, okay. just driveway standard, down the road, the next parcel to the south develops, and the next one, um, at some point, we're going to have to develop this into a municipal road. So how do we ensure that um, everybody contributes fairly, I guess would be my question to administration. You know, I don't, I, it is the same situation as what Councillor Deputy Reeve Waldorf was alluding to similar because who's, who's paying and then we've got all those spaghetti 20s to the south if they want to subdivide them in half, I, I can see that a road through there might be beneficial um, because on the other side uh, of these, I guess it would be the east side of these spaghettis, there's no road allowance there. So this would be their only way in is what I'm guessing. But it's still, I agree with Director Hemingway. Um, I'm not sure why they 
would we not want it on the east side of this parcel rather than through the middle of the two? Well, or? that's how it was originally proposed in 1998, okay. was having this road come in. And you'll see that in your staff report. There was a whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, people that built wells now, you can see the well. I don't, I don't, there's one site plan here that shows that there's wells on the east boundary. Oh, okay. Um, and, you know, having a road come in, at least if not in the middle, somewhere not in the middle, allows you to access both sides of the road. Right. So it, it is more efficient in the location that it's in. Um, and again, it's Alberta Transportation's call generally to allow that. So that, but that was the original proposal was that the road came along the east, the east boundary. Side. Yeah, I see it on 137. Yeah. And that's why it's, I think it's slightly different than what council approved in the land use application. Uh, the road has moved, but I would say it's a good move. Um, and then it, it would allow for those spaghetti twenties to subdivide, not only one five acre on the east side, but maybe a five acre on the west side as well. Um, you know, if you're going to build a road, you got to use it. Councillor McHugh. I'm sorry. I was just scrolling to get to 137. Um, through the chair to the floor. So the intersection of 128 and 547 is the crest of Dropo Hill. Um, so this is about 600 meters back. I I really don't understand why we are, you need, you need to be up there when, uh, <laughs> till Cargill goes away. But when you're sitting up there and a cattle ladder is going by at a buck 20, because that's the general speed up there. Um, I'm really having troubles with this new approach coming out of the 547. I don't know what uh, Alberta Transportation is thinking here. Uh, I would be looking for if this is going to be proposed mm -hmm. at this time, you're almost going to need acceleration, deceleration lanes. Uh, otherwise, I would say that uh, I know we're not responsible for these spaghetti 20s, but uh, should be figuring out access from 128. And we should be looking at getting approaches taken off of the 547 the traffic screams up there and so as i'm saying so i guess you know where i sit with this thing councillor McHugh, on that 137 on the community concept plan proposed future road is that a better solution so what page is that 137 i was still scrolling in i was scrolling and yakking it's a, uh, September 12th at the top. And they're doing the history of it. And they had that concept plan proposed back in the 90s. That must be over the top of the crest then. No? Well, it's, oh, it's, it's all flat. flat. But they, they, still, they still come at a high rate of speed along that highway. I, yeah, I that's... don't know what to say. It, it, you know that the what's proposed on one thirty seven. You know we're we're talking about six hundred meters, so I guess the distance is safe, but uh, it just makes much more sense. You yeah. know we're 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 stuck with spaghetti twenties here. I I just think it yeah, should be for... access from one twenty eight and avoid five forty seven. I don't see that road ever getting completed to the south boundary with owners you get one one owner in between that doesn't participate yeah, and exactly so it's this is just kind of yeah I'm, I'm thinking the better solution would be to stay with the 137 the concept community concept where they had the road going down the back end of all of these and then you know if the guy in the middle wants to develop then he brings the road up to his his spaghetti 20 and and splits it off but uh, the way we have it now, uh, if the one in the middle wants to do it, he's got to make sure that the others are, all agree with him. And that's always been our problem with these these uh, subdivisions. Councillor Seward, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, I'm just a couple things more. I, I'm very much along the same lines that we adopted a community concept plan with consultation with the nation neighbors and to just go and uh, change that all without any consultation with the broader community, I think is a bit problematic. So I guess I would be looking for a refusal today and then um, we can look at that community consultation. 
Um, but I did have a question for Director Hemingway. You said, if I recall correctly, you said uh, no requirement for proof of water. Did I hear that correct? Um, <clears throat> well, we are, we are, there was a requirement in 95 when first reading was granted for meeting the municipal water policy. Um, but in today's uh, legislation, we would require a proof of water as we have listed it as a condition on, um, on your staff report to meet the provincial water policy. Okay, I didn't see that. Okay. Manager Eva Cameron, go ahead. And just a little history on water. When these 20s were created uh, at that time in the 70s, uh, they could not uh, prove water. So they were all required to have uh, cisterns. And we had, at the beginning, we had cistern deposits that we took, uh, I think it was called Gold Key Development, if my memory strikes me correct. And so when a house was built, they had to put a cistern in it so that they could haul water. And that wasn't a, an MD at the time a requirement. It was Calgary Regional Planning and their ultimate wisdom that they approved these 20s that didn't have wells that could service them. So. Anyway, uh, most of the people have eked out finding marginal wells, but as subdivision occurs, um, that uh, uh, we'll see. Uh, that is one of the reasons the road was right on the far east end of the corridor so that it would only allow them one parcel each rather than if you put it in this location, you're generally acquiescing to two parcels each because you'll get one on the east side of the road and one on the west side of the road. It just would make sense if you run it where it's proposed today. Yeah, Councillor Alger. Thanks, Madam Chair. Just uh, reading the letter from the applicant's agent and it looks like a couple of wells would be in effect with the road dedication being on where it is in one page, page 137. Also, when I'm looking on my map, uh, as you get down into the south part of the 20s, it looks like a little bit of a ephemeral waterway that runs through there that would need to be crossed with driveways should, as they develop down the road, but not the end of the road. But I'm wondering if that's one of the reasons that they moved over that way. But kind of in agreement with Mr. Seward that, uh, you know, this was done with public consultation with all the neighbors and this new road dedication, I'm not sure, has been. Go ahead, Director Hemingway. Sure. You, you guys could take a look at your 145 of your staff report, just so we're looking all at the same maps. 145 shows you the, the 150 acres to the east mm -hmm. has a first parcel out. I wouldn't suggest you're going to allow for any more subdivision out of that one, um, but you want a road along its boundary. You always use two sides of a road. If you're going to build a road, you need two sides of the road. If you think you're building a road and you're only going to use one side, you are mistaken. So um, the the design that they're contemplating is much better than the one on the east boundary because these are all country residential parcels. You would likely contemplate infilling of them. I do appreciate the, the discussion on an area of known water shortage as that's what this has always been tagged at but if you move the road to the east boundary as was originally contemplated you are opening up subdivision on two sides of a road which i wouldn't suggest you would support uh, but you'll have to if you have a road there so uh, i think the proposal before you today is a better proposal um but i still think it's very challenging with respect to uh, traffic on 547 um and you know, just an access management strategy to deal with these spaghetti twenties, which are always a challenge throughout the county. Never mind if you're right beside a very busy, very narrow highway like 547. Well, I don't have the answer, but uh, council is not obligated to approve the subdivision, even though the land use is in place. The applicant would have the right to appeal, uh, and it would be an appeal to the LRPT. All right, here we are, dealing with 1996 and beyond. <laughs> uh, 
Um, go ahead, uh, Councillor Seward. Thanks. Yeah, so I'm just looking at the options here. So under postponement, um, until such a time as a non-statutory public meeting has been provided, I think that would be a good opportunity to um, address the address the community and the and the change in plans here. So um, I just would like when there is a plan put in place and the community has adopted it, I would like to um, give them the opportunity to to speak when we're talking about changing it. So I think that postponement is uh, where I would be looking and, and we can plan that um, down the road and hear from not only the applicant, but anybody in the neighborhood who uh, who has a concern and look at it at that point. So I would give you that motion for postponement as laid out, option two. Thank you, Councillor Seward. Any further comments on the motion? I don't see any, so I'll call the vote. All in favor? Thank you, that motion carries. All right, motion to go out of subdivision approving authority. Councillor McHugh, all in favor? Thank you, motion carries. Let's continue on with our miscellaneous municipal items. Uh, F2, Prita Stampede Breakfast, Councillor Ohl. Thank you. So this particular request you've seen before in previous years, and it is much the same. The request is to use the municipal reserve, which is along Prittis Valley Road, just north and west of that road. So north of the, the Prittis Community Association grounds. And then also, should there be a length of grass that perhaps the egg services could have a look at mowing that in the time frame just before that so it needs to be unlocked and mowed and then would be taken care of and then closed up again afterwards by the community so just allowing that permission for the event and in this case it would be Sunday July the 7th 2023 I would be prepared to give you that motion now and await any comments that may come from fellow councillors thank you all right thank you councillor all any further questions or comments on this item I don't see any, so we'll call the vote. All in favor. Thank you. That motion carries, everyone. F4, um, Royal Canadian Legion Military Service Recognition Book, 159 of our agenda. Uh, Manager of Ledge Services, Manager Barrett, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Reed. Thank you, Council. So the Royal Canadian Legion is publishing their uh, annual military service recognition book. It's in support of veterans and functions of the Legion. Uh, the advertising options, I believe, are outlined in today's agenda. Uh, however, the county typically purchases a business card size ad at a cost of uh, $395.24. So today we're just looking for council support again, for this year's publication and direction as to the size of ad that you would like to see placed in the publication. Thank you, uh, Councillor Elder. Thanks, Madam Chair. Always happy to support the Legion. I think over the years I've made the motion for the uh, uh, for the request and I'm happy to do that again today. If you'll notice I have my Legion tie clip on. Very <laughs> proud of the Legion and what they do in the area and uh, deserve our support. No question about it. All right, we have that proposed motion on 159. Thank you, Councillor Alger. Any further comments? Call the vote. All in favor? Thank you. Motion carries. E5, or sorry, F5, U7U Water Co-op request for funds for drilling of new wells. 162, Manager Reva King. It, it, it appears our microphone has your I know your Zoom is unmuted, Harry. Mute your Zoom. Are we okay now? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so this request comes from U Seven U. I can bring up uh, the uh, the map to show Council where that is. Uh, 
So we got to take the names off. So this is the Hawks Landing subdivision, and um, uh, U7U is a subdivision. Through here, uh, there's 18 parcels involved. Uh, this is our fire hall right here. And of course, we ran a water line over to the fire hall. Uh, so um, uh, their situation, um, they are registered with Alberta Environment and they operate their plant in conformance uh, with that. And right now they are having some issues with supply and they're looking to do um, some uh, well work to try and bring that supply back as they're, as they're hauling. Uh, so that's their situation. Um, of course, uh, their one option is to uh, relinquish ownership over to the county and then uh, we would move in and operate the plant. Um, the, of course, their other option is, and the one they're proposing today is for them to uh, do some more work on their, on their present operation and for them to continue operating the plant. We have looked at them, con you know, connecting them to the Pritis Greens uh, Hawks Landing System and uh, there's sufficient license uh, for that to happen. Um, so I, I guess that's a, that's a situation out there. And um, they've made their request. We have helped out um, other um, cooperatives in the past. And uh, unfortunately, we've ended up with ownership of them <laughs> subsequent to that. Uh, so Cottonwood, Pritis Greens uh, Council did provide some gas. It's CC, uh, the, the Building Canada Community Building Fund, as it's called, used to be the gas tax. So uh, I guess it's there for council and, and perhaps uh, reflection on option two. There is the possibility council would direct administration to discuss with U7U uh, the possibility of them connecting to the Pritis Green system. So it would mean the running of a pipeline. Uh, I understand that would be in the three to $400,000 range. So it would probably involve a local improvement of some type. <coughs> Pardon me. Councillor Old, go ahead. Oh, great, thank you. Thanks for providing the background on that. So I guess when I was looking at the request, as uh, water is an issue there, there could be the risk that the drilling of the wells could end up with a similar result, that there's still a problem with the water. And the pipeline is so close within very close reach, it's already come across the highway. So I think the conversation at least could be held in relation to the connection to the potable water pipeline. And then maybe we can revisit however you want to do it, postpone it or refuse it, however you want to do it. But perhaps that conversation can be held and then the financial and the explanation of the financial and local improvement, how that comes about could be discussed with the residents before a decision is made as to whether gas tax. My understanding is that gas tax can be used, and I'm sorry, I'm using the old term, but the Canada Community Building Fund is used for existing only, so it would not apply as far as the pipeline project, but it might be good to have that conversation and create an understanding of what the process is for them and then they could have a discussion amongst their, their group that's all part of this co-op and then see how to proceed. So just my thoughts, look forward to your other comments. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Alger. Thanks, Madam Chair. Is the their little treatment center there south of Ranchers Hill Road there? Is am I seeing that that little building there? Is that the treatment plant existing? On the south of those subdivisions? Down, 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 down. Where the blue is? Down, down, right there. To the right. No, to the right, to the east. No, that's uh, Ranchers Hill. Ranchers so that's Hill a different co-op. Hey. There's is so what I'm getting at is where do we get a tie in from the so the line already comes to our fire department there, right where the blue is, and then where's it yeah, right there, right there, and then where do we have to tie into? We'd run a line off we, the fire. There's an MR, so we'd have to come, yeah, across here and. And up, and I believe to here. Oh, that's very really, okay. Yeah, that's a touch farther than I was thinking. I'm kind of thinking along the lines of uh, Councilor Roll that it's one less treatment plant that we'd have to operate and just tie into what we've already got existing. When's the last time they drilled a well there? How old is that well? Uh, the uh, the dates on. On uh, the subdivision, or I think I just have to pull it up here. This is a pretty old subdivision. It's been here for a while, hasn't it? No, it's um, 17. Before 17. Uh, 2012. 12, okay. Also, <laughs> Mr. Reva Cameron, would it be a, a like a trickle system similar to what we have in Millerville, or would it be a full pressure? Like would all these folks have to put cisterns in and in this case no because they have an existing uh station so we would pump into there and then pump out, out so it wouldn't be a trickle system for them so even if we tied into an existing line that treatment station would still stay yeah you still place. still need the pumps pump into mm -hmm. it yeah Gotcha. Thank you. But you don't have all the chemicals and the other things that you have to do with a, yep. with a treatment uh, plant versus yep. just a uh, just pumping. lift station, if yep. you want to call it that. Yeah, thank you. Right. Have we got a history of any wells close by in the area? Um, you know, the, the problem with these these types and uh, is that, you know, the houses are just being built. So, I mean, there is, they've shown how, how many houses have been built over time. And, um, you know, you're not, we, we haven't reached the end. There's still some more homes to come. Mm -hmm. And so they're having issues right now with uh, the existing number of homes. Let's see, they're showing... Uh, right now they have uh, 10 of the, uh, of the uh, they say 15. Uh, the problem is there's two lots that are have their own wells, and they were the original developers. So if, if this were to happen today, of course, we would not allow that, but it's, it's one of the other issues. So the original developers kept their individual wells, and... Um, then you have the wells for the houses, which take them up to 15, which then make them uh, required to go through Alberta environment. So they have there's 10 houses at this time, and there there's one being built this year. So there'll be a, you know, 11. So full build out may not happen until 2028. So whether you know that as uh, Councillor All mentioned when they drill these two uh, wells that they're proposing, do they end up getting enough water? Yeah. It is, you know, sort of uh, the sus suspect here. Councilor Ol. So perhaps um, municipal manager, Eva Cameron, if you could answer the question as to whether it would be 
appropriate to postpone this item for that discussion or to go with option two and, and revisit if necessary, bring it back on the agenda, which would be the appropriate way to move forward on this so that conversation can be held. Certainly we, we can have that conversation with them. I know they're very concerned as they come into summer that they're going to have to haul and hauling is not inexpensive. So, you know, by the time you finish hauling, you're, you're running about $12 a cubic meter. And that's why they're paying almost $500 a month for, for water right now. But yes, we can have that conversation. Uh, I would probably try to talk to them this week or early next week, um, somehow see where, where they want to head. Uh, I would mention though, that the pipeline, uh, is eligible for, for, uh, funding. Water for life funding. Okay. Well, that's good. I, I think a conversation would be good, but I'll go to you, Councillor Ol. Sure. Uh, would Council be okay with a postponement while well, this goes back for discussion? So I just uh, put that in as a different option, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I would uh, move that we postpone this for this conversation, and then we can discuss whether we would help in some fashion in terms of the hauling or anything else coming out of this in preparation for the a local improvement, which maybe that can be part of it as well. So I'm not sure how creative we need to get on it, but uh, thank you for um, the explanation. And uh, so I will move that as a postponement for discussion. Thank you. And that, then we can look for grant funding opportunities as well. Okay, perfect. All right, we have a motion from Councillor Ohl. Any other comments, questions? Call the vote, all in favor. Thank you, motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Um, F7, Square Butte Hall. Um, we did hear a, a little preamble from Councillor Castell. Did you have anything else? I think their request is for 60,000, is it? Go ahead, Councillor Castell. I don't know if um, CAO Payne talked to them or he just received the, the okay. Um, so on March 15th, I did meet at the president at Square Butte Hall, uh, the treasurer and the past president, and they explained what happened uh, while things were going on right now because the insurance company has stepped in. So as you read the request from Becky Weens, uh, she sent a very detailed report to CAO Payne, which I believe council has a copy of. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of water damage there. The pipes, pipes burst when everything froze. The furnace had quit. Um, the water went permeated into the floor. Me, everything needs to be hauled out of there. The hardwood floors have to be replaced. The floors have heaved. The cabinets are unfit to be re reinstalled because uh, of the, the, the reno. The insurance said they'd cover $134,574.35, but the GST portion is not covered for the, the hall. This is a very old building. It was moved to Square Butte site from Q in about 1966. It was already old then, and the addition was added in 1969 by the community, and it was done by the community. Uh, so when these tra trades, uh, sub trades came in for the insurance work and uh, they noted a lot of original mechanical work was aging and it needed serious repair and, and not up to code. The electrical needed upgrading as well as the plumbing, but that was not caused by the actual event. It is when they started pulling walls out and opening things up. Uh, the board was told that it was a miracle the plumbing had even functioned in the hall since the main drain was undersized and contained improperly spliced joints. Walls were opened up in the downstairs bathrooms and with all the repair work that needed to be done, they decided maybe they should install fixtures that would help conserve water. So I think they're putting in uh, waterless urinals that were donated by a company. So that's a good thing. They, they want to put in a smart thermostat that will alert 
them if something goes wrong again. It's This is an abandoned kind of area where there's nobody right around it. Yeah. And so when they went the next day, there it was. So um, that would be a cost-saving thing too. Uh, because a portion of the work needs to be done is not covered by insurance, they do need assistance from Foothills County. Uh, this community fundraises continually because, as we know, utilities and maintenance upkeep all cost money. The treasurer told me their next casino is not slated until the fourth quarter of 2026, and the money will not come until first quarter of 2027. Meanwhile, they're scrambling to fundraise with online auctions, raffles, dances, but the hall needs to be usable. So hard to fundraise there because you, they, they can't even go in there. There's, there's nothing running. So from the minute the community was contacted, they jumped into help. And I sent you some pictures where volunteers showed up and started pulling the flooring out and taking truckloads to the landfill and help in any way they could. So just this week, they received some more bad news. The drywall needs to be removed. The electrical quote will probably be an, another 2,500 or more, and the plumbing could be an additional 7,500 to 9,500. The interior of the building is the priority now. <laughs> they had plans to do all kinds of things outside, but now they have to abandon all that. So as the president of the board of directors said to me, when I mentioned maybe it would have been easier just to tear it down, start again. Yeah. They said the history and the memories in that old hall make it worth. They think about how the future generations will love it. Um, it's dearly loved by the community. There's families, weddings and funerals take place there. Breakfast, family days, work bees, celebrations, dances. It's a very well used hall. And everyone's engaged from mums and dads, grandmas and grandpas, children and grandchildren. I've been to several events out there. And this is the hub of their community way out in the West Country and a very close-knit community. Um, I know we've helped other community halls like Pritis and Red Deer Lake. And we are fixing up Davisburg Church, um, which to the tune of 78 thousand so um we do help out with these projects and i'm hoping council will consider their request and let them continue to fix the old hall and get ready for events that are already booked it for this and they want to get it done like in two months i don't know if it's being unrealistic but they're they're willing to work and they're willing to get it done i don't know where we take the money from i'm i'm sure staff can um give us an idea of of where the money could come from to to get this project going what's the ask um i think it's 60 isn't it uh 71,071 okay yep. councillor alger go ahead thanks madam chair i certainly have uh no concerns about uh helping these folks out they've uh, as Councillor Castell alluded to, we, we help out our other community associations uh, over the years. There's no question about that. Does the Square Boot Hall fall under any recreation type boards? I haven't heard anything about Square Boot as far as getting funds from like the Dumbo Rec like we do. Councillor Castell? No, they don't. Okay. And the other thing I would concern me is all these people working in here, and, and this is an old building. There's got to be asbestos in here. Like, does anybody... Any checking or testing or they did tell me when I was at the meeting, thankfully there is none. Really? There is none. Oh, no, After sorry. 1960, that was typical. It was before. Before that? Yeah. Yeah. No, they said thankfully when they started pulling things apart and the insurance was in there with all their their people. My question, Councillor Castell, this is um uh west of, of Millerville. And, and Millerville has the Rancher's Hall. So you have two halls that are pretty close proximity, do you not? Like the Rancher's Hall is now owned by um, the Millerville Sports Association. So that's not being that's used? That's not it. Okay, this so is way out on Highway 762, mm -hmm. way out in the west, as far west as you can practically go. What's but, the one, What's the? that's the road that goes to Bragg Creek? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah. So that's only what, five, six kilometers west of Millerville. Mm. But if they're not using oh, no. that hall, that was my question is uh, like, no, they can't use Grand that hall. hall. They can't, it's too small. It's okay. like, and how big is this hall? It's not this, that big. Um, it's long and skinny. I've been in it. Well, it's the, the original um, portion that got moved from Q yeah. was square. And then they added along the south an addition right. that went past it. So it you go in and it's and then you can turn. So it's like an L shape. Yeah. Then there's the basement. All right. Um, any other um comments on this? These old halls, they always need a lot of upkeep. And uh if you don't keep on them, it certainly can be a big bill, as we know. Councillor Ol, go ahead. Sure, thank you. Like all the rest of our projects, I see the work in the presentation you shared with us to show they're working hard to contribute to this. Are they also going to fundraise to be taken at least part of this? They can't fundraise right now because they can't use it. I mean, they, they couldn't put on anything other than online raffles. They can they they fundraise yearly three or four events yearly to keep the place going, you know, aging buildings and insulation and the whole bit. This isn't something that they expected. And so they don't have the money just sitting there waiting They're, you know, and the longer it sits, the bills pile up because you still have to pay heat and light and, and the whole thing. Um, I'm, they are planning to have this casino one, which is a big fundraiser for them. But um, meanwhile, I don't I don't know how we would handle waiting for them to fundraise. They just it, then the and the insurance is picking up a, a large. They're portion picking of up one hundred and thirty. Yeah, yeah. one hundred thirty four thousand. And we would take this out of our contingency uh, that we have staff. Yeah, there's really two options. There's the overall contingency that council had set aside in the 2024 budget, or you could pull it just from the um, specified recreation contingency, which is around $100,000, um, yeah. which wouldn't leave a lot of room there if you took it from that one. But either or, I mean, at the end of the year, um, our financial folks would look at where the best place for something like this would be to come from to be within our budget allocation. Okay, Councillor Seward. Thanks. So yeah, just following up on Councillor Ol's question. So they were planning on doing a bunch of upgrades outside or something uh, this year, but that's now been abandoned. So when I look at, so they're $71,000 short and they're wanting us to cover that whole amount. Um, what what amount were they planning to spend on outdoor um Improvements, I guess, would be my question. Go ahead, ahead. Councillor Castell. Thank you, Madam Reeve, to Councillor Seward. They have abandoned it completely. They, um, but do they, they have money? Because Not now money. they've, ha pardon me. Did they have money set aside for? No, the, they were going to fundraise. For they that. were going to fundraise. Yes, yeah, and they now they have even more that if they started to fundraise online, this extra cost has come in that is not in this report so they've they've been told that um now that they need another about ten thousand for plumbing and electrical that when they started dealing with and maybe my my question would be how do they account for everything that they pay does staff go out there and or do they send in a report or how do they do that should this be approved i, I think, think we would expect a report of some kind a cao paying yeah, it, it really depends on how council words a motion if you were considering proceeding with authorizing um, sharing of the expense of $71,000, but certainly as staff, we would be requesting backup to each of their requests for funding support. So receipts and uh, review of the, the work that's been done. Hey. And just another note, like, I don't know what they'll do if they don't get the funding. They'll just have to stop because it's just way over. I mean, the, the 134000 will finish off the, 
the part for the flooding, but all the other stuff they've opened up. I don't know how they how they do that. Have, Have they, they got, got heat going to it regardless? Is there heat still? Uh, when I was there, there was heat. A repair had been done because this happened in February. So okay. they've had time to get the furnace going or replace the furnace. I'm not sure whether it was, a, I think it was a replacement of the furnace because it conked out. And then there was all the plumbing that they're working on. They're on site now with the insurance company sub trades is where it's at when I was there on March 15th. Haven't been back. Okay. And do we have any idea how many times a year this hall gets used? Because I know with some of these community halls, it's months they sit vacant without any usage. It's used practically every day. They have quilters there. They have sessions. It, it's a really well-used hall. They have events all the time. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor McHugh. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Through the Chair to Councillor Castell. Do we have... Uh... Do we know what their bingo usually brings in? Like, I guess where I'm going to go with this is um, I can see fronting this organization, the funding. This is emergent. It's not in the budget. I can see fronting the municipality, fronting the money, but it would be nice to have a commitment back that uh, perhaps the municipality gets some of uh, the contribution back when they're on their feet. So, uh, you know, bingos can be big, cash raisers um you know for sure we want to help out but it sounds like the maintenance has gone unattended for a very long time so uh i do not believe so that shows a little bit of negligence so i believe the municipality should get a little bit of money back so i will uh proceed with that question i Perhaps it's none of our business, but it would be interesting to know if they're getting 50000 out of the bingo or 20000 and maybe there's a commitment of that money coming back to the municipality if we help them out in the interim with costs. Deputy Reeve Walder. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and through the chair to the floor. AGLC has some uh, conditions in terms of where casino and other revenues come, so that may or may not be possible depending on how it's uh, presented to them. Thank you. Hey, Councillor Castell. Yeah, Madam Reed, um, the, it's casino money, not bingo. So um, I I don't know about how much they would get. I think it depends on the take that night. It's very yeah. varied. So they could make 20,000, they could make 25,000. I don't, I have no idea. Yeah, yeah, and they're not, from what I can understand, and it was an issue at RMA, is that some of the rural communities are waiting a long time to be able to um, access uh, these casinos, and so it's never a guaranteed thing. Um, I'd be in favor of, of this uh, with um, the hall board providing uh, appropriate receipts. Um, I think it needs to be clear, made clear to them that they have to fundraise for ongoing maintenance and that's not obviously been happening. So um, certainly something they need to uh, look at. Yep. And uh, Director Hemingway says they need a building permit so they will have to come in. So I'd, I'd be in favor of it, but I'd look for a motion from someone. Councillor Castell. I would give you the motion, Madam Chair, for um, Square Butte Hall. And the amount they were asking was seventy-one CAO pain is right. telling me. Yeah. Seventy-one zero four zero. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor McHugh. Thank you, Madam Chair, through the chair of the floor. I'm kind of looking at this through the eyes of my DRB hat, and uh, I, I'm okay, as I've earlier stated, to help them out, but I'm looking for some money coming back to the municipality on this, and I would be looking for at least 25% coming back. So do the math how you like, but... Uh, I would just look for a little bit of clarity. Whose insurance is this? 
it's this through the insurance? county. Yeah, they're insured through the county under our policy. Yeah. So that's where I'm at. I, I think there should be a commitment from the community to try to get some of this money back to us. Uh, Councillor Castell, go ahead. Is that what we expect from all of the ones that we help out with that they, so uh, my motion just stands the way it is. Thank you. Um, Councillor Ohl. Sure, I guess in the experience I have with the other community associations, unless they were recipients from the, the rec board funding, which I see this as an anomaly in that sense, they they do have to contribute and we look at the rec board funding all the time that they have put some money in themselves and we make sure that they have some we call it skin in the game so you know i just i wouldn't mind see some come back as well i don't know what percentage would be appropriate but perhaps we can start off with some front front end funding here and then um, have that conversation with the community as as counselor perhaps that that some of the council members would like to see a bit a return just in some effort once the work is done that there might be just uh, that participation uh, from the community. I do see the uh, volunteerism is really high on this as well. So there could be, that could be recorded as well as perhaps some uh, financial as well. So I would, I'd like to see something, but I don't know what that number is. And maybe that can be a separate conversation. So I'm just thinking that it's very common for that to be requested as far as I've seen in the past, even with the rec board, that it's not just, the money isn't just handed over. They have to show in their projects that they have been fundraising as well. And that parents often, which these um, other uh, requests come from various groups, but they have contributed significantly to the request as well. So that's just what I've seen from, from the rec board side of it and um, outright requests as well. And I've seen a tremendous amount of fundraising in the community associations and some of which don't ask for any money at all from the county. So I've seen quite a variety over the years. Thank you. Councillor Seward. Yeah, I do like the idea of requiring um, a portion of the money to come back. No issues with fronting it, but um, I think it is important as has been stated that they do have some skin in the game with this as well. Um, that is what we have required of other community organizations and not um, not too anxious to stray from that. Thanks. Councillor Alger. Thanks, Madam Chair. I'm okay with the motion as stands. The I'm just looking back through my DeWinton just to see if I could come up with a number of what we got for casinos. We have a casino in the third quarter of 24 that we've been waiting on for a long time, but uh, we just used the balance of our funds from our last casino to do the renovation uh, plus the generous funding that we got from the DRB. So, I mean, you know, DeWinton had that leg up to have that uh, recreation funding also that Square View doesn't get. So I wouldn't be looking for a payback in the neighborhood. The I think the skin in the game is uh, you can see in the pictures here, there's all kinds of people running around there helping out and it's a well-used hall. And uh, I think these folks need our support. Thank you. Deputy Reeve Walder. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and through the chair to the floor. I'm fine with the motion that it stands potentially with the um, the recommendation that you had about committing to ongoing maintenance. Yes, I'm a strong proponent of groups contributing recreation grants, et cetera. I see this as a different scenario, though, compared to all of them, because they're all planning for whether it's uh, new playground equipment to ball diamonds, this is all that. This is an emergent an emergency system or a situation, and um, you know, as I say, the the effort of the community they do they do regular fundraising. This came out of the blue, and so as I say, I'm supportive of the motion as well. And uh, turn it over to you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll make a quick comment. Just um, I guess for me, the skin in the game here is that they actually had insurance and have money that they can put towards the renovation. So often we see some of these groups that don't have any. Um, and from the volunteer um, work that's going on, uh, that would suffice for me. I hesitate asking for um, a contribution because uh, we've heard that the outside is needing maintenance. We know that this hall hasn't been maintained. So I think a strong message to this uh, hall board that they need to look at ongoing maintenance 
and if that it's as busy as they say it is and as well used, then certainly they're they're obviously getting money from somebody, uh, rentals or whatever. So that needs to go towards future maintenance. And I think asking them to contribute will just have them turn around and come back to us for for more funding. So um, I'd rather see them look at maintaining it. Um, the volunteerism out there I know is good, but certainly, you know, if they have a hall board, they need to be putting money aside for capital issues that can happen. And I know on other hall boards I've been a part of that, that's an ongoing conversation for sure. So um, I would just have a counselor or maybe add that piece, make sure that it's in as part of her um, uh Motion, Councillor Ole, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, and Councillor Castell's Kel motion. But uh, I guess I just had a, a question for Councillor Alger, just on the amount that was supported to the done um, to the hall that you mentioned. Do you have that figure in mind, approximately what was done for support with the renovation or other? Was it more than the normal kind of maintenance? That was given to. Uh, I I wouldn't call it above and beyond the call of duty. I think it was like fifteen thousand or just under sixteen thousand was the last uh, asked from DRB, and then uh, that was for the siding around the deck. And then I know I've reported in my community re committee reports that we redid the deck because it was two levels, and a lady fell at Canada Day and busted her hand, and so we we uh, through the board made a determination that it was time while we were in that renovation to. Uh, utilize our casino funds and whatever else we had in contingency uh, in the community association bank account to get the deck done at the same time and they just finished it last week and it looks beautiful okay thank you so i guess where i'm going with that is i guess this, if this community has had no support from their recreation boards maybe they need to be put under the millerville in the future as a possibility, but also, I don't know if that fits, but this is, this is significant. This is way more than we do support the others, but it's a one-time ask, but I'm just not sure where, where the future is, but it would be, uh, I think very helpful as was suggested that the local counselor who's very involved would, would impart to the community, the importance of that maintenance and that, it hopefully won't be a repeat. It looks like everything will be taken care of. So I see this as slightly different and it's uh, difficult not to have that commitment to participate, but they are, the, their, their casino isn't even for another year. So they can't even say that they're going to offer any money from the casino, but if they're truly committed, then they'll be doing fundraising as soon as they get a chance. That's what I see happening there is that they're likely to get right on it and participate and maybe even do that exterior as soon as they get the chance. So so I think I'll be supportive because of the uniqueness of the situation. Thank you. Councillor McHugh. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess just a couple points of clarification. Um, so is this a part of, do we not have a water system out in Square Butte somewhere? Is this a part of, um, of the development uh, Square Butte Ranch's development, no, or no. is this a municipal hall? This is hall, a hall way out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and it's municipal, or who owns it, or how does this the, thing work? It's the residents that, it's like the East Longview Hall, it's like all of them. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. And it's been there, yeah, since the 60s, as Councillor Castell says, Um I've, I have been to functions at that hall and uh, the community does cherish it, but they uh, obviously haven't looked after the maintenance. I know they did some additions and whatnot, but uh, things happen and, and systems get old and you just hope as a community association, they hang on long enough till you can afford to do a new one. But Councillor Castell, go ahead. Just as an aside, they did do a huge fundraising and renovated all the ceilings, the kitchen and the everything. Roof. They have been doing that. So um, it, they haven't neglected the building, you know, like it's being made out to. They they have, they have, but this was unfortunate that this flood went through there. And I'm sure they didn't open up walls every year to see how things were doing, but yeah. um, they did do considerable work inside. Okay. Councillor Alger. 
Ernest just went in the Dwinton Community Association Hall also mm -hmm. yeah. last week. Just thank yeah. goodness it wasn't 40 below like happened in that square league. Yeah. All right, we have a motion from Councillor Castell um, and you're amenable to add that piece about maintenance, ongoing maintenance and, and all that good stuff. So uh, we have a motion, any further discussion? I'll ask for the vote, all in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we have a few more minutes. Are we ready for minutes from March the 13th? Councillor Ohl, go ahead. Sure, I have one minor edit okay. on the last page. Just under my committee reports, there's one there that wasn't official, the other was. And just to remove that, other than that, I was okay with it, but I would look for anyone else who has comments. Okay, anyone else? You'll Just give... the one, Sherry. Yeah, thanks, so Councillor. Oh, yeah, it's not official. Okay, and you'll give us that motion, yes, Councillor. Yes, I will. Thank you so much. Uh, all in favor of minutes? Thank you. And accounts, are we ready with accounts? Any questions on the accounts? Uh, Councillor Alger. No issues on my part, Madam Chair, so I have to give you the motion when required. Okay, Councillor Alger gives us a motion. Any further questions on accounts? I'll call the vote, all in favor? Thank you, motion carries on accounts. Um, let's start our committee reports. Councillor Castell, would you like to start us off? Thank you, Madam Marie. Um, I attended the Leighton Art Centre meeting by Zoom. I was a lot to catch up since Leighton hasn't been open for the winter months. And they're starting to get going April 6th with workshops, exhibitions, registrations for summer camps, which will start on July 2nd. I had a county cemetery committee meeting March 21st. It was a very short meeting with cemetery specialist uh, Rogers giving her report. We went over all the action items. We had a report on the Davisburg Church renovations. The budget for that project was 78,000 and the foundation replacement and repairs have totaled 27,600 so far. So we're within our budget so far, but there's still more repairs, mainly the pouring of the concrete pad, ease tropping and roofing. And to make it more aesthetically pleasing, some rock wood around the bottom will make it look a lot cleaner. Um, uh, Monday, uh, March 25th, we had the FCSS committee meeting by Zoom. Um, we went over 10 applications. One needs to come back to us next meeting for some clarification because there was some information missing in the application. Uh, we uh, approved nine applications, which will probably come to council next week. And FCSS coordinator Midgley went over her updates and report for the committee. Some of the information caused some concern as there is an increase in residents asking for assistance. In some cases, um, double and triple depending on the needs. Um, it, it's, a, it's a problem now in the county and in the towns that um, there's some people who are actually homeless and don't have anywhere to live and are setting up camps uh, in tents. So there is an issue in our area. And yesterday, um, most of you were there. I just uh, zoomed in to watch the IMC meeting, which was very interesting. Council representatives and staff did an excellent job during all the updates and closed session discussions. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor McHugh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let's turn the chair to the floor. Well, I guess. I guess I would start with the convention. Like the uh, kind of like the format, it's kind of seemed short and sweet. I don't was didn't seem onerous at all. Um, 
the one open house I did attend was uh, the Alice open house. And Alice is a uh, trust with a twist is the way I would describe it. And uh, kind of an interesting, um, they, they provide a lot of flexibility. They will support projects from farmers and ranchers. And uh, it's kind of an open book concept they'll kind of consider a number of things i have seen this presentation before and once we have a field person hired i think that uh, through asb i may suggest that uh, we pursue alice a little bit further uh, one twist in the conversation kind of revolved around carbon credits but i uh, did not really hear a conclusion as to whether they're collecting them or not collecting them was kind of a willy-nilly conversation that didn't really go anywhere. Um, as far as the resolutions go, they were pretty much standard quo. Can't say that uh, anything stands out there. And uh, the minister forums, as always, were very interesting. Uh, let the other councillors comment. Dunbo Rec Board on Monday... And I apologize, I was coming out of Calgary from Physio and missed uh, cemeteries. And uh, due to the road conditions, I just couldn't uh, jump on the phone. Uh, and, uh, so my regrets for missing county cemeteries. Dumbo Rec Board was intake day. And, uh, you know, we had a pretty much a full complement of members. It was kind of nice to have one, two, three, four, five five members at large and myself and Councillor Waldorf and I believe Ellen Alger was listening in Councillor Alger and uh, we had three three intakes and I believe we did uh, everybody got some money uh, no we had four intakes yeah so kind of a large one and Mr. Payne isn't here at the moment uh, but at some point the uh, one from Heritage Heights School is a rather large ask. Uh, the entirety of the ask is uh, between CFIP and the rest of it. Was that new campgrounds worth 220? 250? 330. 330. Anyway, uh, Dumbo Record is going to supply a letter of support towards 45 while they work through their, their uh, CFIP grant. But uh, you know, I, I just think about these uh, at some point. I hope we can test this out. I, if we have money in uh, public reserve from schools uh, at the cost of these playgrounds and the time and the grant applications that everything happens, somehow this needs to be simpler. And uh, at some point, I would like to see these capital projects supported perhaps through public reserve. So that'd be my comment on that. And uh, the other asks were smaller kind of three coming in uh, mini creek mini creek mini creek pony club looking for prince phillips games and uh, they received three quarters of their ask and dumbo pony club received a little bit and the dewitt and riding club received a little bit what the heck day was that now so then we were on to yesterday. Can I remember yesterday? Joint Health and Safety Committee was short and sweet. Did our incident review. Did a review of uh, landfill. Did we do landfill walkthrough of their assessment? So anyway, and then uh, Town of Okotoks. Always interesting. IMC. Uh, and, uh, that is what happened in the last two weeks. Thank you very much. Councillor Alger. Three, three minutes. Three minutes? Three, Watch me. Three minutes. <laughs> Lunch isn't here yet, so we're good. It takes yeah. me a minute to get the microphone going. Quit that. Leave it anyway. Mine can be very brief, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, county cemeteries, <laughs> as uh, Councillor Castell said, a very short. Not much going on in the old winter time, but we went through a few things and now uh, you run a pretty quick, pretty quick meeting. So you get two seconds to say you get something to say and then we move on so it was very brief yeah we were done in probably half an hour uh but a good group of folks no doubt about it 
Uh, also on Monday, I just uh, zoomed into the DRB meeting just to, uh, as I say, I like to keep an eye on what's going on in my alternate world. And that's been spoken to by uh, Mr. McHugh and also will probably be spoke to with Deputy Reed. Uh, yesterday, I also zoomed into the town of Okotoks IMC and I agree, always interesting. And then uh, jumped in the car for 4.30 West Winds Finance Committee meeting at 4.30 in, uh, at the uh, Medicine Tree Manor. And uh, so we had the Avail uh, group come in and do their audit of, of, uh, of West Winds and always a strong portfolio and uh, no concerns whatsoever with Avail because of our, uh, our uh, very fine accounting team there uh, led by Simon Lee. And uh, that blended into our West Winds board meeting that we had. And again, we went through with the board uh, all the financial implications and our new chair, Don Harriman, who has done a spectacular job. He is also part of the ASHA conference board, uh, which is the uh, mother board of, of uh, West Winds. Um, and uh, he's been writing letters right, left and center to, um, to the uh, seniors and community and social services. So to Jason Nixon, uh, also David Williams, who is the assistant deputy minister of seniors, community and social services. And Philip Hankey who is the director of the uh, Housing Management Board Operations and Compliance Division. Through that, the uh, province in their budget this year has increased the lodge. Oh, I, knew I was going to forget this. LAB, it's called Lodge Assistance Benefit uh, that has not been raised in probably 15 years. Uh, increased it by 55%, which is equates to in the three hundred thousand dollar range for West Winds community, so big, big, big help. And again, the letters went out just to thank all those, all those gentlemen for their, uh, for their excellent work uh, in the province. And uh, that's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right, uh, we are at twelve noon. Good job. Uh, I'll take a motion for lunch, please, uh, Councillor Alger. All in favor? Thank you, and we'll see you back at uh, one o'clock, everyone. Thank you.
Welcome back, Foothills County. We'll continue on with our afternoon session. Uh, we are doing committee reports, and uh, next up, we have Deputy Reed Walder. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and through the chair to the floor. CMRB land use and servicing on March 14th started out with the Foothills County land acknowledgement. Much of the meeting was receiving reports for information. A couple of the highlights, there was a housing needs assessment um, study, and it talked about um, the future. And one of the one of the things that garnered some discussion was the number of high number of single person households in uh, much of the region. In terms of some of the reports that we received was the Springbank Offstream Reservoir Land Use Plan, Regional Transportation and Transit Master Plan, the CMRB drought response, not much to report there because they're uh, they're meeting with uh, with the tag team on that. And the, um, uh, sorry, yeah, no, it was, uh, it was actually quite a lengthy meeting, but as I say, much of it was revolving around reports that we were receiving. That afternoon, we had the Foothills Regional Airport Board meeting. Some of the highlights were the emergency response plan was presented to the airport board. The Alberta Air Tours potential visit coming to uh, Foothills Airport was discussed and what's coming back from the group as a plan because it's it's grown from burgers on a on a barbecue to something much larger. So we, of course we need to uh, see about um, special event permits, etc. There was some issue with the pilot lounge and some maintenance and some plumbing is needed to be repaired. The board actually talked about some potential revenue generation uh, opportunities, aircraft recovery free in terms of accidents, possibly um, charging some of the renters that that have airplanes in the hangars in addition to the owners. And then there was some housekeeping of officially naming the part nine company, the Foothills Regional Airport Limited and changing the name of the board to the Foothills Regional Airport Board. So that all passed. That evening joined in on the Prairie Mountain Health Advisory Council meeting. Very short, the uh, the chair had resigned and this was her final meeting. And again, they're not sure if it, uh, the meeting ended with a meeting in May as possible. So really don't have too, too much to report on that. RMA Spring Convention has been touched on um, by a few people. In terms of uh, direct involvement, the Rural Caucus meeting took place and I'll let Reed Miller talk about that, as well as the Mayors and Reeds Liaison meeting took took place as well. We participated in the economic development micro grant presentation. And I'd like to uh, thank Deputy Director McLean for her assistance with all the background information. Honestly, she could have given the she could have given the uh, the presentation had she been in Edmonton, but uh, that was the um, I guess the three additional areas that we were involved in over the course of the um, convention. Monday, we had a Foothills Regional Airport special meeting with the prime purpose of reviewing the emergency response plan, which was approved by the Foothills Airport Board, which means that it'll be coming to council for our uh, discussion on it as well. And then we also, we learned at RMA that there's actually a working group of a number of the regional airports, which we are now part of. And there is a, um, a letter draft that we looked at going to Minister Dreeshin in terms of some additional funding for regional airports throughout the province. So the board was certainly very supportive of that. And again, there'll be an item coming to council in the next week or two to see whether we're council is in support of uh, expressing our support to the uh, to that letter. Dumbo Recreation Board application review meeting was well reported on and um, don't think I need to add anything to that as was the joint health and safety meeting on March 26th. Again, well uh, well reported on as well. And yesterday's Okotoks Fiddles County IMC meeting attended that. And uh, I'll leave that to Reed Miller as well. And that's all I have, thank you. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, also attended the convention on uh, March 18th. Uh, Foothills County was the host for the growth management board rural caucus and i just want to thank staff for uh organizing that um uh and providing all the little 
mini donuts and the snacks for, for that event. Um, on the agenda, of course, always round tables from both uh, both municipalities. Um, our EMRB um, sort of filled us in on what's been happening. Uh, I think they said they have a rolling business plan and the core core priorities and employment areas. Um, uh, dispute committee set up an ag asset master plan and regional plan waste so it sounds like they've been doing some work but i always ask the question of value of the emrb and i get a deer in the headlight look response so um then uh, we had on their uh, rural municipal affairs minister um i did receive support from the board on that um we did have uh, the uh, RMA president there, and he did make a comment, uh, something uh, along the lines of um, they could possibly take forward, take it forward if uh, we wanted them to, um, if Foothills doesn't want to do a resolution. So I think that's a discussion we need to have. Um, uh, I think it's a great idea. It, it does receive a lot of support. But I think it's probably more suited for RMA to take forward than maybe for us. But um, I, they don't. Well, they're sitting on the fence a little bit, I guess, on it. I think they they support the idea, but um, I think it just bears more discussion between the two of us. Um, uh, Sturgeon County made a, some interesting comments there. Uh, with regard to the EMRB membership, they actually put that on the agenda and they made a motion in February of 2024 to review the membership. And um, it sounds like uh, the way uh, the mayor explained to me that they would be looking at perhaps exiting the plan. So um, that was what I got out of that. Um, we did have a Mares and Reeves, uh, on the agenda. I did put the solar pause. I thought we'd probably get a lot more, uh, comments about it, but, um, there was a bit conversation about the agro, agrivoltaics on it. Um, and, uh, what that means, uh, there was party politics in municipal elections, um, was brought up from Beaver County. We all know it's not being well supported, but in the cities, uh, I'm hearing that the UCP is definitely looking at uh, a party format within Edmonton and the city of Calgary. Uh, victim services was brought up again, concerns, lack of communication to rural areas. That was brought up by Reeve Karina Williams of Northern Sunrise County, a regional airports by Reeve uh, Angela Alberts from Mountain View County. And uh, Deputy Reeve made a good contact with her on, on that funding. Um, future of the RCMP, um, what that looks like. Uh, and and uh, sort of to go to your federal MP because that's more in their realm if we have more to discuss. On the floor, it was brought up uh, carbon net zero, what that means, TELUS line locates. Um, TELUS is, as of April 1st, not wanting to do any uh, line locates uh, without a cost. So that's a concern, but one of the uh, one of the members brought up an interesting comment, which there is no lines to locate; they're all hanging on our fence posts. <laughs> so <laughs> we've all seen that. Um, uh, one member brought up his concerns about the banks asking, uh, making you sign paperwork saying you're a politically exposed person. So I've had that. Um, uh, flagged onto my account for quite some time now since I became a counselor and it's just a, a flag they put on your account because you are uh, more apt to be uh, exposed to um, uh, any type of uh, uh, money, laundering. money laundering or any type of 
fraud. Uh, so they, they always flag anybody who's got a political position. So I assured him that it was nothing to be concerned about that, um, that fin track uh, really couldn't catch anybody if they tried. So um, that got an, a good laugh at the convention. So uh, that's, that was that portion. Um, RMA had lots of, lots of good speakers. The bear pit was uh, really good. We had a chance to meet with Minister MacGyver, uh, uh, expressed our concerns on grant funding on uh, CMRB and uh, the Green Haven issue. And um, I felt like uh, we were listened to um, on that, on those topics. I had uh, landfill, regional landfill service commissions. Um, we are looking at a new contractor for our wood grinding. We're going to enter into contract with Mulchco for the three-year uh, contract with them to uh, grind our, our wood. Uh, we have um, transferred over another 500,000 to our site closure, uh, cell closure, or, or the landfill site closure, whenever that will come. We, we do have to have money put away for, for that because that's an expensive undertaking. Um, we've got the geotechnical work being done on the new shop and that's just been completed. Um, the report will become public next month. And we'll go out to RFP pretty soon on that. Uh, we needed to do a bit more prep work and hydro seeding on the um, on the cell that we've uh, covered, so that'll be happening shortly. Um, I think that was all the highlights I can remember on that. Uh, we had the wastewater, which is our Frank Lake. Uh, not much to report on there, except Manager Reva Kimbert offered U of L um, has, will be giving a report on the work they've done on Frank Lake and that we're still working on our um, grant funding uh, that we've obtained for our wastewater treatment plant to see if it's feasible to do a wastewater treatment plant jointly with Town High River. Um, I then had uh, our uh, IMC with um, with Okotoks has uh, has been well reported on. Um, we got updates on the Okotoks raw water line project and also uh, an update on the discussion with the joint planning area three, which was uh, done by Foothills County, and I believe that's the highlights of that one. And uh, I'll go on to you, Councillor. Oh, Councillor McHugh, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And through the chair of the floor, uh, just before we move on, I just wanted to go back and give kudos to Deputy Reeve Waldorf, uh, the economic um, development micro grant was presented by uh, Deputy Reeve. Waldorf and three other municipalities the three. Mm -hmm. and anyway uh, so that was on the main stage in front of the entirety of uh, the convention and uh, I thought Deputy Reeve Waldorf number one he led the charge and uh, did Foothills proud so thank you thank you, yeah. you Councillor McHugh yes um, kudos to our Deputy Reeve and our staff for um, that presentation on the micro grant for our economic development committee. Uh, Councillor Seward, go ahead. Well, mine will be pretty quick after all of this. Um, High River Regional or Foothills Regional Airport already reported on. I think nothing more to add on that. FCSS um, already been reported on. So thank you to that. And we'll see the details of that likely next week or the week after so um then just thank you to deputy waldorf for covering me off yesterday at the okotoks imc um just under the weather this week so thank you very much that's all i had thank, thank you. you i neglected to also add i had longview rec board last night um we are discussing a new possibility of some new horseshoe shoe pits out there <laughs> 
And uh, <laughs> and maybe I better quit. <laughs> I'll go on to you, Counselor. <laughs> Hard to follow that one. Um, some of these were reported on already, but I did attend the CMRB Land Use and Servicing Committee, and the highlights were the housing needs assessment, um, the draft, spring bank off stream, and scoping transportation stuff. But I just had a couple comments on the regional housing needs assessment. I'll just say that's very urban in terms of its nature, but it was CMHC funded, and it uses public census data. And is a projection for 2031. But I, I just made a few highlights for myself that I thought were kind of kind of stuck out to me. Is um, I, I just I looked at the the stuff they were presenting to us in a nice little format and everything, but they really it just seems wrong to me to measure and label people in races, and that's kind of how they presented that information. It just seems wrong to me, and 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 based on income, where the gaps were in housing and such. So I guess that's where they make their decisions to come up with the the uh, non-market, they call it housing. And they're at a level where they need to expand from 300 to 3000. Apparently that's their intention. And then Calgary gave a stat that they were at 8,000 for market builds per year. And they're looking to expand to 9,000 units. And Airdrie said they were at 1300 units per year. So just hearing what they're aspirations were and what they currently were building out was kind of interesting to see the numbers they were putting around. There was lots of assumptions in all of this data. So again, as much as everybody wants to rely on, and this was information that they could all avail themselves to separately as municipalities, this was done for the region, but they could do it individually for municipalities. I think you have to really uh, ground truth your information when you're looking at the way that they've come up with this information. And then the next data apparently isn't until 2026. And so they were, you know, doing their best they could with doing the analysis, just helping the urban centers to plan. And the SR1 topic was interesting. They gave a, a high level overview to talk about how the parks situation was going to be used and how they came up with all this um, determined use of the property when it wasn't being used as a diversion off of the main elbow during a flood event. So it was interesting to see how they came up with this through lots of consultation, but um, Dawn from Rocky View County did kind of mention that there was a lot of input from Rocky View County that just hasn't shown up anywhere yet, nowhere in any of the plans. And he was assured, well, that's going to come up uh, likely through the approvals under the Water Act, and it would be coming up in the form of maintenance. So as far as I can see is Rocky View County has not really been a part of something that is part of their municipality and they are going to have to be watching it like a hawk to make sure that what they're hoping would be the common sense part of this whole project is going to materialize. So I'm hoping for their, for their sake that it all turns out. So, okay, enough on that. Um, I also attended the Okotoks IMC and I thought everybody represented the county well on that. And uh, thanks to everybody for your reports and comments there. And lastly, attended the uh, Ann and Sandy Cross Conservation Area Board meeting as well. And at just a quick update, uh, we're continuing along with the CEO recruitment and also uh, numerous projects are, are continuing. Winter education programs took place. Winter events took place. They've been taking on pres professional development for the staff. Numerous, uh, uh, many different types of projects on the land are going on, and it's a really active landscape as far as a uh, numerous different organizations are hoping to do help do remediation on wetlands and other different features that will help continue it to be a very, uh, a very healthy landscape. So that's a very short version, but if anyone wants any more details, I'll, I'll be happy to share. That's it for my reports. Thank you. Councillor McHugh. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Through the Chair to Council all the 8,000 units for Calgary and the 1,300 units for Airdrie that you mentioned, was that a certain place type or is that just all new builds in a year? Madam Reeve, if I may, it's yeah. just uh, what they mentioned as their market bills. So non-market would be for filling in the gaps of the housing needed in the core area for, for, uh, challenged situations where they're helping to fund for the low-income housing. And then the other numbers are for markets. So as in builds, 
that they're aspiring to build. So what they have built was the 8,000 and they want to expand to 9,000 units. That's market. Building. That's, they call it market housing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Um, Director Hemingway, did you have anything in open? Um, just to point out to council, I think you know this, that the Enerfin application to the AUC has been made and I have put the agenda item on next week's council agenda to discuss our position and um, and that's the one regarding the um, battery, battery energy storage systems out by Frank Lake. I just want council to give me a motion of direction with respect to if we are taking an intervener position and if we are um, contemplating utilizing legal assistance. All right, and you'll have that on the agenda, as you said, next week. All right. Everything, everything else I attended, you've already discussed. All right, thank you. Manager Reba Cambrin, go ahead. Uh, so in open, I bring council up to date. Um, we're renewing our approval with the environment out at West Foothills. And uh, so we should... Council may see an advertisement coming up here in the next week or two uh, in the paper. Um, so we we are subject to people filing statements of concern. Uh, but uh, I guess uh, <laughs> I, I don't know where that would take us because it's just a renewal. The um, Alderside uh, plant uh, next week at uh, 1.30, Associated Representatives from Associated Engineering will be here, and they're going to run us through a 3D model of the plant and uh, provide an update. Um, that is still ongoing and looks like the end of April before we go to tender on the on the water treatment plant, but they'll they'll provide an update. Uh, Deputy Director Glant provided council with an update on the uh, the pipeline. Um, so with all the work going on and, and some of the uh, delays, um, that project probably won't be completed till end of June, early July. So mm -hmm. there's still quite a bit of work to go there. And uh, once we start drilling under the railway that'll be interesting cp has to be present and unfortunately we have to pay them to be present so <clears throat> um maybe we better stop there <laughs> if you don't mind and we'll get ready for our 1 30 hearing we'll come back to you thanks manager eva kingman let's take a five minute break we'll get all our guests in here thank you
Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I will open the hearing for 2388086 Alberta ULC slash SJM Developments, Northwest 302028, West of the Fourth, a redesignation from DC number three to country residential. I'll ask Manager Barrett if you please introduce Council and Administration. Thank you, Madam Reeve. Good afternoon. In Council this afternoon, you have Councillor Suzanne Ohl, CAO Ryan Payne, Hello. Reeve Delilah Miller, Hello. Deputy Reeve Don Waldor, <laughs> Director of Planning Heather Hemingway, Councillor Alan Alger, Councillor R.D. McHugh, Councillor Barb Castell, Municipal Manager Harry River Cameron, and online we have Councillor Rob Seward. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, Manager Barrett. I'll just briefly outline our hearing process. Uh, first, we'll have a presentation from our municipal planner. This afternoon, it's Planning Officer DiMaggio. Then we'll go to the applicant and the applicant's agent for their presentation and comments. We'll then hear from anyone from the gallery who wishes to speak uh, that has concerns regarding the application. We ask that you try to keep your comments to five minutes and they be relevant to uh, this application. At any time, council and administration will be allowed to ask questions of anyone speaking or present. Um, I'll just remind the folks in the gallery that uh, you will have one chance to speak to council and one chance only. So please ask your questions at that time if you have any. Uh, finally, we'll welcome closing remarks from the applicant and then from the our municipal planner. So with that, I'll ask Planning Officer DiMaggio to please proceed. Right. Thank you and good afternoon. The application before council today is a request to redesignate the subject 78.16 acre direct control district number three to country residential district to allow for the future subdivision of 15 country residential district lots, municipal reserve, environmental reserve, and internal road development. This application also includes a site specific amendment to allow for a six unit bed and breakfast on the subject parcel. The subject parcel is located within Division 7, approximately 4.8 kilometers east of the town of Oak Tokes, directly east of 80th Street, and adjacent to the Sheep River. The application proposes the creation of a total of 15 country residential district lots. This includes 14 lots, as shown here, ranging in size from 2.46 acres to 3.27 acres, leaving a 5-acre balanced parcel shown here. The application provides a total of 5.54 acres be designated as municipal reserve, which includes one 4.03 acre parcel along the west boundary of the development and one 1.51 acre parcel further east. Uh, this meets the required 10% as per the county's municipal reserve policy. The county's parks and recreation department provided that the lands within the 1.51 acre MR parcel have seen erosion and slumping in the past, and these lands have the potential to be further degraded in the future. The application also proposes that 22.67 acres be designated as environmental res reserve, shaded here along the Sheep River and associated banks to the river. These lands have slopes in excess of 15%. In consideration of public safety, the Parks and Recreation Department recommends that there be no public access available to this ER. Access is proposed via a new internal subdivision road, shown here by the red arrow. All approaches to the new CR and MR lots will be located along a 30-meter wide internal road, and access to the ER parcel, if required, can be achieved through the 1.51-acre MR parcel. Public Works is recommending that 5 meters along the west side of 80th Street, or sorry, the west side of the subject parcel, parallel to 80th Street, be surveyed out for future road widening, in addition, the department is recommending that a traffic impact assessment be completed as a condition of first reading to identify any transportation improvements and or possible contributions towards upgrading 80th Street. 
With regards to servicing, individual groundwater wells are to be drilled for the new lots in accordance with the Provincial Water Act as a condition of first reading. All lots are to develop individual private sewage treatment systems in accordance with the PSTS report that is to be provided as a condition of subdivision. A stormwater management plan was completed in 2018. However, that plan was specific to a smaller area surrounding the existing development on the parcel, and therefore Public Works is recommending that a new stormwater management plan be submitted for the entire parcel as a condition of first reading. In addition, the department recommends that a lock grading and drainage plan be submitted for each individual lot as a condition of the subsequent development permits to ensure compliance with the overall stormwater plan. The property is primarily flat pasture and cropland with a steep slope or steep bank along the east side of the parcel that slopes down towards the Sheep River. There's an existing pond within the boundaries of the proposed 1.51 acre MR lot, which is to be decommissioned and reclaimed to its natural state. Mature trees line the existing driveway and surround the yard site. The trees along the driveway are purposely located outside the proposed internal road network and are intended to remain within the boundaries of the proposed lots to the north. The application is proposing in to install a fence and construct a landscape berm along the north boundary located entirely within the boundaries of the subject parcel. A geotechnical investigation was completed in March of 2023. This report provides that the site is suitable for the proposed development and includes recommendations for general site preparation, foundations, and slope stability assessment. The slope analysis recommended maintaining a setback distance from the slopes along the east boundary. Therefore, the building envelopes for proposed lots 7, 8, and 10 through 12 include a 30 meter setback along the ER boundary identified here in pink. All existing development is to remain within the balanced parcel, which includes a residence with the attached garage five accessory, and five accessory buildings. The horse shelter located within the proposed boundaries of lot six does not meet the required setback and is to be removed. Previous approval was granted for the operation of a six-unit bed and breakfast and wedding venue on the subject parcel. This development permit was not issued due to incomplete pre-release conditions and was considered null and void as of January 2020. The applicants no longer wish to operate the wedding venue on this parcel. However, it is intended that the balanced parcel be redesignated to country residential with a site-specific amendment to continue the operation of a six-unit bed and breakfast. Should the application before you today be approved and finalized, a subsequent development permit application will be required for the operation of the bed and breakfast. This is a photo facing northeast, showing the lands along the north boundary, with 80th Street to the left and the existing tree line to the right. This is a photo facing southeast, showing the lands on the south and the approximate location of the internal road with 80th Street to the right. This is a photo facing northeast with the proposed ER to the right, the existing residence towards the back, and the approximate location of the proposed MR to the left. And this is a photo facing southwest of the proposed ER to the right, or sorry, to the left, with the approximate location of the 30 meter setback area along the ER boundary. The application was circulated to all required internal and external agencies. Some of the comments received have been outlined in previous slides and complete responses to the referral of this application have been included within the staff report. The county's GIS mapping department provided that the existing address on site will need to be updated and if the subdivision is approved, the applicants are to determine if they wish to name the internal road. Alberta Transportation and Economic Corridors provided further notification that future interchange is planned for the intersection of Highway 2 and 338th Avenue to the north, and the intersection of Highway 2 and 370th Avenue to the south will be closed. Today's public hearing was advertised in the Western Wheel newspaper on March 13th and March 20th. Letters notifying area landowners within one half mile surrounding the subject parcel was sent on March 6th and seven letters from area residents were submitted and sent to council prior to today's hearing. Thank you, and this concludes the presentation. Thank you. 
Any questions from council or administration at this time? I don't see any, so at this time, I'll go to you, Agent Bunder, for your presentation and introductions, please. Thank you, Madam Reeve. Uh, with me today is Hugh Slocum, and he lives in the home on the parcel and would uh, be the operator of the bed and breakfast should council uh, permit that use here. I am just going to share my screen and then go into the full screen. Should just be a minute. You can do it. There we go. Thank you, Madam Reeve. Um, as, as Ms. DeMongeos has indicated, this is a land use amendment from direct control district number three, which the entire parcel is zoned to country residential district to allow for the creation of a 14 lot country residential subdivision with uh, municipal reserve parcels and a significant environmental reserve dedication. Uh, uh, the uh, bed and breakfast would be located on the five acre balance. Uh, our, our proposal is to remove the DC3 zoning from this property, um, as well as remove the wedding venue use. And we are requesting a site specific amendment here to allow for the retention of the six room bed and breakfast by virtue of the site specific amendment. And we would come back for a new development permit on the five acre parcel. I wanted to provide council just a bit of an exaggerated topography overlay, just to give you an idea of how the topography works in here. Um, there are steep valley banks associated with the environmental reserve. Uh, there is a bit of a sloughing here um, and that Mr. Porter, Porter and I have discussed at length and I'm prepared, you know, certainly to chat with council about why this is this way. Um, the lots are reorganized and one is, there's one less from our previous application. Additionally, um, instead of linear strip like MRs, we included a MR parcel. Um, the last application had a strip linear MR and it wasn't supported by council. So we've revised this application this time around to hopefully uh, have it improved for sure um, and address some of the concerns we heard the last time. Um, this is currently designated DC3, which allows for the development use and operation of facilities for retreats, meetings, recreations, and, and spa treatments and the like. Uh, we are proposing to eliminate this district and redesignate to CR. Uh, the parcel is located in the central district. It is accessible by Highway 2 via 370th Avenue and 80th Street East. 80th Street is developed to a country, uh, sorry, a county standard and can support the added traffic. Public Works is requesting that a TIA at the first reading stage be conducted along 80th Street to ensure any required improvements or contributions as a result of this development are understood. Um, we have no objection to that request. Uh, Right now, 80th Street is a chip seal standard, um, and I don't believe it's been upgraded since the chip seal has been put on it. Um, it is proximate to significant urban development in the town of Okotoks and multi-lot country residential at Ravencrest. It aligns with the county's intention to capitalize on the existing infrastructure in Highway 2, um, which is part of the reason why the Central District is drawn the way it is. The Alberta Transportation had no concerns and they suggested that noise mitigation and screening is the responsibility of the developer. And that's consistent with um, the issuance of a, of a noise mitigation memo that the, the, the transportation department had sent out uh, to most affected parties on highways, as well as to consider including warning residents about closing intersections and the route to this location being more circuitous in future as a result. With regard to access, we do understand that count, the county has requested a five meter road widening along the west side. This will allow for, uh, in future, this right of way to be a 30 meter right of way instead of a 20. Um, and Alberta Transportation has plans and has funded, as we read in the wheel, uh, the 338th intersection, which would result in the closing of both 370 and 338th for an indefinite amount of time. 
The proposed development will have a different route to Highway 2 once the overpass is completed. Um, sorry, this is a lengthy slide, but I think it's an important one. Um, in discussion with parks, uh, they were, the expectation is that this is e, this ER not be permitted public access, primarily due to the steepness of terrain. And we have no problem with that. However, ER does have to have a municipal reserve access and connection to it. So I had provided one, that 1 1.5 acre um, parcel on top here uh, to connect it as required. However, the intention was that it not be traversable and that this is only a viewpoint um, because I did that really because the viewpoints are all back of lot and and this is all private property. There would be no view to the Sheep River for any resident interior to the development unless I provided one. So I felt I'd provide one and we'd put a bench on it and that would be it. I, it wasn't intended to have a tremendous amount of public access and, and really none at all. Um, alternatively, uh, Parks is suggesting that we remove this MR and include a three meter linear strip between lots 11 and 12, which is here, uh, in order to allow the county access to the environmental reserve in the case of an emergency. Um, so I have, I have no issue with that and I will take council's direction on it. I think we all agree that this should not be an environmental reserve with public access. It's just a matter of how we resolve that with council. Um, we also heard from neighbors that the wedding venue allowed for too much trespass in the river valley and disturbance of private property with regard to music and noise. And as a result, that is eliminated as a use. And again, we heard uh, concerns about trespass associated with the use of this property and it is our goal to ensure that this environmental reserve is not utilized for public access. Um, we also heard from neighbors to the south that the pathway along this escarpment was not welcomed as it invited trespass. And therefore the pathway that is there is now covered under a restrictive covenant as a no development area and would be retained back of lot. Um, the restrictive covenant is also to include architectural controls that speak to education of residents regarding trespass, safety, uh, dogs, lack of public access or use to this ER. Um, and we discussed ERE as an option, Mr. Porter and I. However, given the size of the site and its characteristics, um, it meets the definition of ER by virtue of its steepness and uh, its characteristics are more properly treated as environmental reserve. Um, we have done two geotechnical tests on this property. The first one was done by Curtis Geo, and then a second was done by Prairie Geo. And I'd just like to go over those with council. Um, Curtis, Curtis had reviewed the escarpment by the house, and this was part of the wedding venue B&B &B development permit requirements. Um, in order to ensure that this land was suitable and that this home was in a safe location. The Curtis Geo assessment concluded that the land proposed for residential development, in this case, the wedding venue only, was suitable for development from an overall stability point of view, that runoff and precipitation over the site should be collected by gutters and directly away from the building. That is what led us to developing a storm pond. We had a parking lot proposed north of this house. Uh, Storm Pond was developed in what is the Municipal Reserve area now, but there was no parking lot ever developed, and the, the Storm Pond never collected a drop of water as a result. So it's our request that we um, decommission that pond and reevaluate Storm, and again, Public Works has asked for that, and we have no concerns. Um, they are suggesting as well that the existing vegetation over the slope should not be removed to protect those slopes from erosion and all modifications to slopes should be carried out under the supervision of a geotechnical engineer. They did a factor of safety analysis on the house, and this is an area very similar to the municipal reserve provided at this location, um, because the cross section is very close. And the slope stability, the slope stability is described in terms of factors of safety, either a, a, against slope failure, which is a ratio of essentially total, the total forces resisting failure divided by the sum of forces promoting failure. Um, in general, a factor of safety less than one indicates that failure is expected 
and a factor of safety more than one indicates that the slope is stable. Um, a steepened slope will slump back over time and establishing a stable profile for the existing soil and groundwater conditions is important. Um, any long-term stable slope is considered to have a factor of safety of over 1.3. So uh, the house itself had a factor of safety of 2.2. Um, so pretty, pretty good. It's in good shape there. We also did a second geotechnical on the entirety of the property. Um, and this was done by Prairie Geo. And the following recommendations were provided for the natural slope and potential earthworks on the property. Um, they found that the suitability analysis factor of safety uh, could be achieved at, uh, which was 1.3, as I've discussed, could be achieved at 25 meters back from the current crest of the steepest slope in the ravine. Um, this is a this is retrogressive. Uh, smaller localized failures are not expected to encroach within the factor of safety of 1.3. So they had made a recommendation to retain a minimum setback distance of 25 meters from the crest of the ravine slope for any road development. We have uh, taken it a little further. We've included a 30 meter setback from the top of slope um, and protected this area from development of any kind by way of restrictive covenant. The impact of the proposed residential development on the local uh, on the local slope stability will be minimal as long as the existing slope face remain closed and the existing conditions and above recommendations are followed. So there's another really good reason to ensure that there's no public trespass in the environmental reserve. Um, and we certainly want to work with council on that. Um, this report also includes recommendations on septic installation and hydraulic loading rates, uh, which are found in the SOP or the standard of practice in, for installation of septic fields. Uh, they recommended vertical separation rates, foundation preparation as well to ensure slope stability over time. So that's a, a report that we have provided to the county and was undertaken as a pre-development study in this application. I also uh, went back to the water well reports. We did a preliminary groundwater feasibility assessment for this application when it was first brought to council in 2017. Um, I didn't feel a need to update it because there wasn't any new wells drilled in the area nor pump tested and the reconnaissance report was identical. Um, and what we had done in this preliminary groundwater feasibility assessment was we evaluated the effect of multiple wells. And you don't often see that in, P in preliminary groundwater feasibility assessments, but that was something that I had asked for. And what I had asked the hydrologist to do was calculate static head, see how much was there, and how much drawdown would be incurred with the new wells at this location. Um, their conclusions were that the maximum effect of 16 wells, in this case, it's not 16 anymore, it's 15 and 14, if you count the fact that there's already a house that has one, uh, would be approximately 12 meters of drawdown and the available drawdown is over 20 and there should be sufficient head available to ensure that the wells will not go dry. Um, additionally, we did the whisker plot, which shows the static water levels by decade. And the data shows no lowering of water levels um, observed and the water levels are relatively consistent. Both the calculations and the historic water show that the water supply is sustainable in the area. So as council can see, um, most, if not all of the water wells in the county in the nineties were drawn down. And that was a, a, big, a big part of that was a lot of development in the county in the nineties but the static had recovered and it is not dropping through the, the 2000s and the 2010s. Um, certainly we recognize that this is a time of drought, but I feel if you can prove a well in a time of drought, you're not gonna have problems with that well going forward. Um, this is just a, a shot of our previous application showing where we had linear MR. Um, in this revised application, there is no longer a linear MR and the escarpment is protected by development by restrictive covenant and architectural control. And I mean all development, no sheds, no nothing can go on there. Uh, the North MR is removed and a new Birmingham planting and strategy in the rear of the lot is proposed here. Um, this was in response to neighbors concern for privacy and a request for improved delineation of property lines in this area. Um, a larger single MR parcel is being provided in the revision. So kind of where we had lot 16, 15, and 14. Um, 
And the MR can be further revised should council prefer the requested three meter strip of MR where we had proposed it at the location of this previous lot seven. We have reduced the new application by one lot as well. Um, in terms of the internal road, uh, the internal road placement was revised from the previous application. Um, I had previously put the internal road down the existing driveway uh, where the double tree stands are. Um, it's my understanding that the road development would kill all of those trees and it wasn't wide enough. Um, but I really like them. They're a nice established bunch of, of spruce trees. And I thought they'd be really nice kind of to drive into the lots through those, through those trees. So I tried to retain as many as possible, uh, bumped the road down in order to do so. Um, it, this really is intended to protect these, these trees because they have a presence on this site. Um, and we also wanted to ensure that the homes were moved forward on the lot, again, to ensure privacy and, and a buffering strategy that's effective. The Birmingham landscaping plan we've provided um, has a list uh, of, of species and specimens will be subject to a letter of credit and cost estimate in a development agreement. Um, <clears throat> what we have done uh, in the past, so the most recent one I can think of was the Pine Springs uh, municipal reserve that has a considerable amount of planting and improvements in it. And essentially we cost estimated those improvements. They are carried as part of the letter of credit and a two year maintenance period is required. Um, we have discouraged outdoor watering with, with groundwater sources. So the developer will have to get a water truck in here in order to sustain these berms and these plantings for at least two years to ensure that they take hold and thrive. Um, it's important to note that given the odd shape of this parcel, it was difficult to achieve all parcels over three acres. And that is a magic number as council knows for livestock, but given the density objectives in the land use bylaw and the ER and MR dedications, as well as just the escarpment and the existing residents and the strange shape of this parcel, um, it resulted in the lots north of the road being over three acres and the lots south being less than three. And we recognize that this causes problems for animal units. And we will include in the restrictive covenant and architectural controls, a restriction on livestock and the number of dogs. However, the architectural controls cannot supersede the land use bylaw as we're aware, um, but it does provide some civil remedy should somebody want to put a, some livestock on their property. Um, dog restrictions will include dog enclosure and fencing on leash requirements and recognition of agricultural livestock in the area and that they not be harassed. I know that council also has a responsible dog ownership bylaw that, that residents can utilize to protect themselves and their property from dogs or, or bad owners. Really, it's not the dogs. In terms of a buffering strategy, we've reduced the number of lots overlooking to the east based on previous neighbor feedback. Only the existing house will be able to view the home down in the river valley and to the east. Lots adjacent to the north property long, and I think that's, that's another reason why I stuck this MR here, just to push this away so they couldn't view around the corner into the DeVries home. Um, lots adjacent to the north property line are longer and deeper in order to accommodate that berming and buffing, buffering strategy. So the berming and buffering will go along the back of these lots, which are longer to accommodate it. Uh, replacement of the fence, which was requested by the landowners to the north and the east. Uh, Maybe we can just close it while it's stop. Okay. Sorry about that. That's Sorry. quite all right. It was a nice interjection. It's $75 fine at Rocky View County <laughs> or a donation to STARS. All right. Um, lots adjacent to the north are longer, as I'd mentioned. Replacement of the fence and reestablishing that 30-meter drive aisle. So there is a 30-meter panhandle that uh, this driveway goes right down the middle of down to the to the DeVries property. Uh, we wanted to reestablish that property line. The fence has been knocked over. It's not in good shape. It, it's not pretty back there. We want to reestablish that and provide berming and buffering all through here. Um, 
as mentioned, we'd included a 30 meter restricted building area on those escarpments to forbid buildings of any kind within 30 meters of that escarpment. This is um, what we had intended for the berm. And I think I just wanted to, to walk council through it. Um, so the adjacent property has a 30 meter drive aisle. And what we had proposed to do is reinstall the fence and have a nicer unified fence along that property line. And then the berm itself is a soil berm with plantings below the berm. So these are not on top of a berm. Um, we did this berm design at other locations in the county and it's worked quite well. If we stick the trees on top, it won't work. The, the trees will die. So the water runs off the berm into lateral trenches here that feed these trees, as well as we would supplant and supplement these trees with a hauled in water source until they were um, taking hold and, and ensured that they were healthy. And the location of the screening would be all along this drive aisle. Um, in terms of the architectural controls, these would be implemented through a restrictive covenant registered on title and be self-regulated post-review by the developer. So the developer would review and stamp uh, and release the building permits provided they met the architectural controls. We've done this quite successfully for Calgary industrial properties by Red Deer Lake on the east side. Um, there was only eight lots there. And with 15, there's just not a number of a good number of people there to incept a homeowners association. So, you know, you have to have a president and minutes and secretary and treasurer, and there's, there's just no people who want to do that. So we register these on title, the developer reviews the development permits, um, and it is self-enforced by the homeowners association. If you have a restrictive covenant on title, it does provide some civil remedy between neighbors. Our hope is that that doesn't happen. And it usually doesn't. Um, the controls are in, tended to include low water use fixtures in the building envelope, dark sky compliance with the dark sky bylaw. Like there's a suggestion that there's no dark skies initiatives here, but we actually have to follow the bylaw and we'll do so. Um, no use of groundwater for landscaping. Uh, intention to explain the municipal reserve and the environmental reserve and the aspects of use and non-use enforcement and ownership of these lands, because they would be public. Um, the 30 meter restricted building area on the escarpment lots, we'd register each lot with an identified building envelope. Um, utilization of high efficiency septic systems. And these are $40,000 now. They used to be 24, but I looked at them the other day and they've really gone up um, in alignment with the geotechnical recommendations. Um, promotion of zero escaping and drought tolerant planting schemes outside of that berm. Screening and berming along the north boundary, implementing landscape buffering guidelines dog control measures, and ensuring each home is constructed to a comparable standard in order to hold value within this community with design guidelines such as appropriate architectural skies, styles, fascia, color, soffits, eaves, chimneys, exterior finishing, and outside drainage. Um, with regard to the adjacent land uses, um, we are proximate to a cattle operation. And in 2017, one of the reasons for refusal was proximity to an intensive livestock operation. Um, and now this section is not intended to be disrespectful to anyone or the livestock operation I'm talking about, but it is simply in, intended to, to understand the use and our compatibility with it. Um, we reviewed the county land file as well as the NRC, NRCB records for intensive registered intensive livestock operations and confined feeding operations. Uh, and there is no permit uh, uh, for an ILO to the north, either municipally or provincially. And that is the only reason why I looked is because that was a reason for refusal in the past. Um, as a result, we reviewed the province of Alberta's minimum distance separation requirements, which recommend isolation distances, uh, which were introduced for the establishment of new and expanding livestock confinement systems. The distances were based on division 23, where a hundred or more cattle were kept um, and distances were measured from the nearest edge of the facility based on two categories, uh, enclosures, buildings or corrals and catch basins or lagoons. The guidelines were applied as follows. So they talk about public places requiring a 1500 foot uh, setback, country residents non-farm, which is what this is required a 1500 meter setback, and they recommend a half mile for enclosures, buildings, and corrals, one mile for catch basins or lagoons. 
um, and a surface water, if there's any surface water, the required distance is 50 feet. So we've estimated the acreage in tidal to the north at 582 acres in that section outside of the five subdivisions that have been allowed there. And that allows for 193 cows. The operator has subdivided five parcels from their original holdings. And these are Sierra residences. In addition, there are three additional residences located on these lands on an unsubdivided balance in each quarter. Um, and these are closer than the ones we are proposing. Uh, based on our analysis, the application is compliant with the recommendations for isolation distance between cattle operations and country residential developments. The, these distances were based on NRCB Division 23, where 100 or more cattle were kept. Um, again, that 1500 meter or 1500 foot recommendation, which is 475 meters, and that half mile or one mile are for catch basins or lagoons. So. Uh, the, the NRCB directive advises to take the measurement from the edge of corral. Um, most of the cattle are in the middle and all the corrals are to the north. So I took a distance from the southernmost corral at 2,675 feet. And then this water body, I'm not sure if it's a lagoon or a surface water feature. If it's a lagoon, we are one foot shy of the required separation distance. If it's a water feature or a pond, it only requires a 50 foot setback. Um, and the berming and planting strategy on the north side of the project also works to protect the cattle operation and buffer the residents. In terms of policy in the municipal development plan, the proposal aligns with the policies of the residential section. We believe it's compatible with surrounding area uses and density. And that's another reason why I dug into that ILO. It efficiently utilizes land for residential purposes while protecting and preserving the ravine associated with the Sheep River at this location. Okay. Um, in terms of environmental conservation and open space, ER has been dedicated based on the geotechnical slope stability assessment, and the proposed development has been carefully designed to respect the ravine areas and efficiently utilize the developable land. In terms of the growth management strategy, we are in the central district outside of JPA 3. We are intended to support the majority of growth in the county and the groundwater feasibility assessment that was provided suggests the proposed parcel will be able to supply, well, we will be able to supply water to these proposed lots. Um, in terms of public works recommendations, uh, the, a TIA is required at 80th Street and that's fine. This is a little further south at 80th Street. This is um, the turn to the cattle operation. You can see that the road falls apart a little, but there's also a ton of heavy iron across the road. Um, it seems like it's outdoor storage of some kind. It doesn't have a permit as far as I know, but there's a lot of heavy equipment going into this side as well. So I think it's worth having a look at. Um, Public Works has also requested a new stormwater management plan at the land use stage. Uh, we would more than likely use lot level BMPs here, or best management practices, um, but that's not a problem if council directs that. We can certainly accommodate it. The only issue I have with this is we would have to design the road to accomplish the stormwater management plan because we'd need to know which the ditch conveyance is and how much it can hold in order to ensure that the lot level BMPs work. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, and at the subdivision stage, a five meter road widening, the PSTS, which is public private septic treatment, treatment systems test, and the engineered building envelopes are being requested. Um, we did public engagement in uh, for this application. So back in 2017, I did an open house. I sent uh, 44 mail outs to neighboring properties and we had 17 attendees. Uh, this year, I in February, I used a more direct approach um, and I mailed the landowners who previously appeared uh, at our public hearing, as well as those contiguous to this application, so that was a total of 12. I included the revised site plan and the buffer plan and an explanation of the things we'd heard in the past and the revisions that we had made in order to address them. We offered meetings, a discussion, teams calls, whatever, but nobody called us, no one talked to us at all. Um, in conclusion, expense, extensive background due diligence has been conducted to demonstrate the suitability of this site to support the proposed development, including the preliminary groundwater feasibility assessment in two geotechnicals. It aligns with the municipal policy objectives for efficient use of land, protecting and preserving the environment and associated habitats, 
uh, contextually appropriate development in the central district, but outside of a JPA and utilizing existing infrastructure. Uh, we are trying to be sustainable, sensitive, efficient in what we're doing here. Um, and our engagement was attempted, but no responses were received. Um, before I conclude, I'm going to ask Mr. Slocum if he has anything that he would like to add. Good afternoon, Madam Reeve and Council. Uh, my name is Hugh Slocum, uh, along with my wife, Kristen, and our large horde of kids. We live on the property. Uh, we moved in in 2017, and since that time, uh, the property has not operated as a bed and breakfast. We kind of filled it up. Again, we're a big blended family. Um, we fell in love with the property and the area. We love the Sheep River Valley. And uh, coming out of Calgary, I mean, I can understand the comments of every one of my neighbors who says they love this area and want to protect this river valley. And I get that because it is absolutely stunning. And, th and that's why we want to, you know, have the opportunity to live here forever, <laughs> essentially. Um, like some of our neighbors, uh, we would love to be able to have, uh, you know, additional family members and family groups live close to us. And, and the way for us to be able to do that is through this subdivision. Um, we had worked on uh, another way to try and buy this and, and finance this, uh, and COVID kind of shut down a few things. And so this has uh, reinvigorated the opportunity to uh, expand the property uh, into this subdivision. It was really the, the news of the changes to uh, traffic, the um, proposed overpass at 338 and, and even the closure at 370 that reinvigorated the thoughts of this project. I know in speaking to uh, people prior and the agent, that traffic was a big concern. These are dangerous intersections. And once two, uh, once 370 has been closed down, the traffic going by our property is going to significantly um, be reduced. Um, people coming in from Okotoks and crossing over and going by us uh, is a significant amount of traffic on 80th Street. And so I, I think this from my perspective, is a, is a good opportunity. And in fact, even with the additional uh, 14 residences should be a significant reduction in the actual traffic that goes down 80th Street. Um, we want as a long-term project to be able to, to run this bed and breakfast. We have tried to open up this really fantastic property to several of our neighbors by inviting them over. We've gotten to know the Casey's and the Burgess to the south. They've both uh, written letters and, and I believe are uh, attending um, by Zoom. Uh, but, you know, great families. They've got kids and we've tried to, uh, you know, give access to the aspects of our property that would be helpful to them. The Gilcrests to the northwest um, are, they've just very recently moved in. They wrote a letter in support of having new neighbors. Um, but, you know, we wish to expand that. We would like to be able to um, open ourselves up to the neighborhood, which I understand the previous owner maybe wasn't uh, quite so open to. And so we're hoping that, you know, us being here seven years now and, and hopefully continuing on is going to open a new chapter on, on that front, at least. Again, we, we are concerned about the concerns of our neighbors. And I think, you know, having this opportunity is, is great. And I would you know, Madam Reeve, to the, the people in the gallery, uh, would enjoy the opportunity to speak with them more directly and introduce them to the agent uh, on that front. And I think that a lot of the concerns that have been been raised um, can be addressed from sort of the, the policy and, and procedures. And I understand that change is hard and adding new neighbors to any country residential area is going to have pushback. Why would anyone want to have more people in there but i think this is where the county is is looking to build this is in the central district and i think this will be a positive addition and that once change is accepted uh, i think we can do lots of things to to help address and, and make things better for our neighbors thank you thank you Madam Reed. Thank, thank you, you. and there's our presentation thank you thank you there's no other people in your party that are connected with your um i have mr i have some of my uh, landowners are online, but they're not speaking. Mr. Slocum will be speaking today. All right. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to questions from Council and Administration. Councillor Alder, go ahead. 
Thanks, Madam Chair. Thanks, Ms. Bunder, for your presentation. Just, if you would, a little clarification on, um, you talked about our architectural controls and restrictive covenants. I think mostly restrictive covenants. Just a, a little bit of clarity on how, what kind of authority you think that restrictive covenants has over our land use bylaws. And what I'm specifically speaking of is animals that you spoke of restricting the animal uses. How do I, if I buy a lot there, it's over three acres and I want to have a horse, then how does restrict, what's the power of a restrictive covenants in your world? Um, thank you for the question. Um, and this comes up a lot. Um, as a member of the Calgary Subdivision Development Appeal Board, we do see a lot of restrictive covenants that are aged and they come out of neighborhoods and they suggest single family homes only. And as a board, we ignore the restrictive covenants. And as a council, you need to do the same. So if we have an aspect of our architectural controls that are contrary to the land use bylaw, it at least provides some civil remedy between neighbors with regard to the rules of the community. I, if someone comes in for an application for a horse um, on this lot, they would be in contravention of the architectural control, but they could do it under the land use bylaw. So it would require some civil remedy. I think the architectural controls, the way that they're registered would be the same way that we did them in Hawks Landing, which is the restrictive covenant includes the building envelope and the architectural controls as one document for each lot. Each landowner is subject to the same architectural controls and restrictive covenants. And because we just don't have a critical mass here, like other communities, it's self-enforced. So, and that's really all I can do in this in this instance. Um, if I had an HOA or a community association, it would be a little more restrictive and a little more implementable. But what we try to do is implement it at the building permit stage. So we have been, our, like our company itself has been looking at the building permits on behalf of developers and ensuring that there's no exterior hose bibs and they meet the requirements of the the restrictive covenant and they're in the right place in the building envelope and all of those things before we allow people to come in for buildings. Once the buildings and the homes are established though, the enforcement is by is a neighborly one. So that's that's really all I can offer. Uh, without a critical mass of homeowners, it's, it's challenging to enforce some of the things. Um, and I certainly cannot supersede the land use bylaw with those. I cannot. In order for me to get them all three, I have to drop a lot. So if that's council's preference, that's what I'd have to do. Just because of the weirdness of the shape that we're dealing with here. Okay. Thanks for that. Thank you. Councillor McHugh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through the chair to the applicant's agent. So can we get 80th Street clarified here? Uh, maybe a slight chance that you could call it chip seal going to the south, but it's not. It's MRO. And your picture clearly shows that going to the north to 338, that it's MRO. It's a, I would consider it a cold mixed chip seal. Maybe we're talking the same language. You call it MRO. It's, it's MRO. It is not a chip seal standard. It, I believe it's a cold mix. Is that what you consider MRO? Yeah. Well, what I consider it, I can't say in here. It's, <laughs> it is not a chip seal standard. It's, okay. it's MRO. Well, and that's why we would agree to it. It's an MRO of varying widths and standards going north for a mile over dipping and hazardous sight line conditions. Uh I'm not disagreeing with that. I think our sight lines to our access are very good. Um, and the traffic impact assessment that was requested on 80th Street will identify required upgrades. And that would be, in my understanding, over and above the community sustainability fee. And we haven't objected to that request. Okay. And um, let's go to stormwater. Okay, so when I look at this thing, I'm looking at the MR and I'm looking at the elevations and we have a slumping MR. Um, you know, I heard you refer in your uh, presentation about conveyance of water from the ditch. So while the berms are a benefit, they're also a hindrance to the storm water management. Somehow we have to protect that MR, but without sloping everything to the ditch, 
then how do we not flood out the neighbor to the south if that's the way it conveys? Uh, I just see some real big stormwater challenges here. Do you have any other comments on that? I guess I'm really worried about that MR and how we keep a sloughing MR from deteriorating further and eroding uh, with stormwater and not having the entirety of the property slough in the river, including the uh, house that's already there. I believe that I partially addressed the back half of your question with the geotechnical analysis that was done on the property. So the house has a factor of safety of 2.2, which is well over the 1.3 for long-term stability. The rest of the escarpment at 25 meters back, according to Prairie Geo, has a factor of safety of 1.3. That is why I've added a 30 meter restrictive covenant on the back to ensure there is no development, which includes no storm, no septic, no shed, nothing, no hydraulic loading whatsoever within that 30 meters. In the last year, it's been interesting. There's been a water uh, pond on top. Um, I hadn't seen that previously, uh, but the MR that we had didn't didn't pick up a drop of stormwater. So I think that the stormwater pond we had in that MR was designed specifically for a paved parking lot associated with the red, the wedding rev, uh, wedding venue that would have been on this lot here, uh, which would have easily picked up lot a lot of lot drainage had the parking lot been here. Yeah. What I'm talking about in terms of the stormwater management plan is we need to understand what the conveyance capacity of the road is, these ditches, in order to determine what best management practices from a stormwater perspective we do on lot. Typically, we are not doing stormwater management facilities in these developments because the county does not want the maintenance obligation. So we, we look at the ditches, we try to ensure that the conveyance does not go um, over and above the post-development release rate. So as you know, we have a pre-development and a post-development release rate. We have to abide by. No additional water can come off of this land as a result of development. It needs to be contained. And what we've been doing is lot level best BMPs or, or lot level stormwater management plans for each lot, including the capacity of the ditches to hold and convey storm. And that's what I was talking about. We don't understand that yet. And that is part of the process. And that's why it's been asked for at first reading, which is fair. All right, right. any other questions? Um, I may have missed a little bit of your comment on the feedlot. Can you mm -hmm. kind of go through that? Did you say they had no NRCB approval? Okay, that's what I thought I heard you say. And how many cattle estimated there? Um, so what I had done is I just took kind of the section and I'm not sure if the, if the operator owns the entire section, but I think it's family run. And I had 582 acres there outside of the subdivisions that they've done, um, which gives them 193 cows. And I see them in the summer. I don't see them as much in the winter. All right. Thanks, Thanks for that. Um, and then I heard you talk about uh, no N not using groundwater for landscaping. Mm -hmm. So what's your plan then for landscaping? So you, what we have found is that we have asked people to use rainwater barrels or haul into a cistern if they want to water their lawns and their gardens. And that's been working pretty well. We've, we've really put our foot down on that with the um, Calgary Industrial Properties application that Mr. Sidorsky did on the east side of Red Deer Lake. Um, so we have actually pushed people to a cistern in a haul-in situation if they wish to run a sprinkler and irrigate their lawn, or they wish to have planter baskets that they wish to water, and we have no exterior hose bib allowances. So that's, and that's been working. That's something new. And we also are going to talk about xeriscaping in our architectural controls so that people understand what drought tolerant planting is and what this environment can and cannot sustain. Um, and my last question is regarding uh, uh, the water wells on this site. So at what point or, or would you consider or could you consider a communal water system on here? I think um, to answer your question, Madam Reva, a communal system could be considered. However, when I looked at all of the water well drilling reports, particularly the first well that was drilled here on this this parcel, which is country residential, was 10 IGPM. These are going to be deep. There's no doubt about it, but they produced. 
So from that perspective, I think individual would work. I also worry again, that we don't have a critical mass of people here um, and the county would have to run that uh, water co-op. If that's what the county wants to do, that's fine. But I don't know that you want those obligations on this piecemeal basis. I think the more uh, efficient way of servicing communally is to have 30 or more just because of the cost of operating a system like that, both to the county and if the residents took it over as well. All right, thanks, thanks for, for that. that. Anyone else, any questions? Councillor McHugh. Uh, Madam Chairman, looking for a point of clarity from, I just want to clear up the ILO issue here. So what I'm looking for is this is a cow-calf operation. So the reason the cows are there in the uh, in the winter is because the cows are home for winter feeding, and then they go out to pasture in the summer. So I'm just looking for somebody to clarify uh, if you require an ILO for winter feeding of cows. So I don't know if we have someone in the well, administration I, that can my, answer I that think question. My point is, even though this landowner does not have an ILO permit, he has enough acreage to have that many cows. So I'm being right. a little, I am trying to suggest that we're aware of this. And I checked the minimum distance separation regulations as a result, because I, the, the reason, the written reason for refusal was proximity to an ILO and there isn't a registered ILO here. It's by virtue of the acreage and title that they have that many cattle. They don't need an ILO permit for it. That's my, my opinion. Director Hemingway can correct me. Go ahead, ahead, Director. Do you have yeah, anything? I there? don't. I would have to check the acreage and know the number of animal units. We don't include calves when we consider the animal units. So I, I'd have to do get some information to answer the question. But we do base animal units numbers on the number of acres available. So it isn't just ownership. It's the number of acres that are actually available. Councillor no, McHugh. Sure, thanks. So I guess through the chair to the floor, I, I just wanted to be clear that this is not a feedlot operation. Uh, and then I just wanted to say, I think we're in agreement there. And, uh, but anyway, it's the proximity. So then I, I would question where you, where you're doing your measurement from. Uh, I would do it, pull it from the south boundary. I wouldn't pull it from the, from the last crop. If there's a question there, Madam Reeve, if the interpretation of the minimum distance separation regulation as written by the NRCB is from the corrals. So it says enclosures, buildings, or corrals, not south property line. So that is the measurement that we took, Madam Reeve. All, All right. right. Thank, Thank you, you for that, Councillor McHugh. Boy, these buttons are sticky today. I would just say it's not appropriate. It's not an appropriate measurement. Um, yeah, I guess uh, my for, thought on for it a is... a cow-calf operation, so it's not applicable. I guess that's up for interpretation. Uh, I was real, merely getting at, is it a um, is it a recognized feedlot approved by the NRCB? And it's not. So that's all I wanted to know about it. So thank you. Um We'll now go to uh, the gallery, and I do have uh, a speaking list here, so um, you're welcome to come up and provide comment if you wish. It's not mandatory, but you're on my list. Um, so I have, is it Sheila McNally? Do we have? All right. Sorry about that. I've mispronounced your name. All right. <laughs> Come on up. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Drew Atkins. I'm unfortunately two of the worst professions on the planet, a lawyer and a land developer. Um, some of you don't know me. Some of you do. I was here 15 years ago with Mike Holmes, and we were responsible for the Windwalk debacle. 
I'm presently very similar. It's still in litigation with Okotoks, but I have been a longtime family friend of Sheila. I went to high school with her back in the 80s. And ironically, when I was practicing the aforementioned law as a lawyer in Toronto, Leo was my boss. That's her husband, Leo DeBello. Um, I'm just going to do a quick presentation here this afternoon. Let me just grab my, my material. Sure. Sure. Okay, so as I mentioned um, this afternoon, I'm here as the legal agent for Sheila McNally. Um, they're on holidays, so unfortunately they're unable to attend. They may or may not be watching. She hasn't indicated if they crawled in from the beach they're on to watch what's happening here. Um, we are objecting to the application. Um, Part of my land development experience, my father is an architect and he developed certain communities in Calgary in particular, one that's particularly relevant in my opinion here that I helped him um, do in the at what was then the MD of Rocky View. It's called The Slopes. It was the first community in Calgary that was on, it was originally on two acre country residential lots. And the most important two elements there were the um, geotechnical report and the overland drainage. Um, I'm gonna go to both of those concerns, but in the meantime, I'm gonna start off by speaking about uh, Sheila's main objections obviously relate to the environmental issues around the Sheep River, uh, the animal pathways, and um, obviously um, she objects to the amount of density, both on a transportation issue, as far as how many units are being put in there, and I have been to their, what I call the big rock compound many times. As anyone who's been anywhere near there, it is a horrible transportation issue. I understand they're gonna shut down uh, 370 and turn it to 338, but I like to think I'm a good driver and I've almost been run over every time I've gone there. Um, adding that many units is, is very problematic from a uh, transportation side. Uh, when we did develop the slopes, it was also off of Stony Trail now. So we were used to dealing with those kind of transportation issues. But to me, the my submission would be that this kind of density at this time before the 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 road has been redeveloped and the the future entrance developed is unnecessarily dangerous and very problematic. Uh, now, I reviewed all of the, it was fun reading. Uh, she just called me yesterday and asked me, or a couple days ago and asked me if I wouldn't mind doing it. So I reviewed the geotech report and the overland drainage. When we developed the slopes in Rocky View 20, I guess 35 years ago now, almost 33 years ago, um, the geotech and was the most important thing because if you're building houses close to that escarpment or on, on a slope like that, um, the number one issue, and it happened in numerous subdivisions in Cochrane, is the houses sliding or you know building berms and retaining walls are is particularly if you're using overland drainage is is uh, very dangerous from not only a liability perspective for the municipality and the developer, but uh, the number one rule with dealing with Mother Nature is you don't interfere with her. You let her work the way that she has. If you think you're going to change the way the water and the drainage and the other flow has been going and the stability of the slope over the last 100 years by putting in um, different a different development, a more dense development, in my opinion, and my submission, you're making an error. If you look at the um, geotechnical report, in particular, as far as section 5.2, I'm a little confused by some of the, the statements in the geotechnical report. It seems to me that the original idea was to allow the town of Okotoks to provide the servicing, so water, sewer, and, um, and the first few paragraphs of the geotechnical report relate to that. And um, I can speak personally, Never wait for the town of Okotoks to deliver servicing to you. 
Um, but they then, uh, through the course of the report at the very end, they then speak to the idea that it would be on-site septic and on-site water wells instead of um, a municipal servicing of some sort. I acknowledge that in section um, 5.6, they did go and start testing some of the lots for the septic fields. But uh, in my professional estimation, um, given the delicate nature of the slopes and the, I'm not talking my development, I'm talking the slopes on site, I went and took a look at it, um, and the river escarpment, to change from uh, what I would call municipal servicing into a lot by lot servicing, if there's any issues with the septic fields, um, there could be some slope instability and some sliding. So to me, um, before any approval would be granted, this is acknowledged in the geotechnical report. It would seem to me that the applicant should be putting forward a lot by lot assessment of the ability to put in a septic field. My comment also goes into um, the water. Most of the water reports, as you know, if you look at them, they were from 1990, 92, 98. The newest one was 2016, 2017. Obviously, there's some very significantly different water and drought conditions occurring, uh, as you know, uh, in the province. Uh, if you go to section 4.6 of the geotechnical report, it talks about berms and backsloping, and then it talks about storm wa stormwater management. And as um, Councillor McHugh has pointed out, there, there seems to me to be some contradiction between the age of the stormwater management report and the geotechnical report as to what the impact of the overland drainage will be on that. I would have asked for further clarification as to what the impact of putting that much surface area. Um, what we did is you can put in on the restrictive covenant, you can put in a non-tree removal clause and you try to keep the natural grass and the natural tree conditions. Um, but I did look at the site, there aren't a lot of uh, natural trees there. I know that the, the applicant is asking to keep whatever trees are there, but those trees are mainly as a road condition. Um, I've made some conversation about the transportation on the roads and the access, and I, I, I don't have much to say on the adjacent landowner, the Imler family. Um, they don't know me, but they did actually work my land in Okotoks for 10 years. Um, and they are very well connected um, to the McNally's and uh, Leo and good friends of them. Um, so I do know that uh, they're trying to mitigate the dog situation and having dogs there. You can put in a dog requirement. We put in restrictive covenants where you have to put in a dog run. Um, and that the, the property has to be fenced if you have any animals. I understand that's what they're attempting to do. I'm not sure if that applies in, in this area. And I noted that there were some concerns about that. Um, Sorry, let me just go back on that one statement that I made uh, in the geotech report about the servicing being potentially from Okotoks originally. That was in section 5.2, if anyone, just for the record. So in conclusion, I don't want to ramble. My voice is equally annoying as the land of Elfora as the lawyer. It's very nice seeing the members that I've recognized and I greatly appreciate all the um, things that the thoughtfulness and kindness that I've had in this room. Um, but as I said, unfortunately, I'm a traitor to my cause today. I'm a lawyer, not a land developer. I would be and submit that there are some significant concerns relating to the combination of the overland drainage and the geotech report in this matter, and that some further requirements are, re are necessary. I'm open to any questions. Thank you. I'll just see if uh, we have any questions for you. Councillor McHugh. Is that you?
think Garrity's playing with my button. Uh, through the chair to the applicant's agent, I, I guess I just would ask to identify the property you're representing or have someone point out the lands that are being represented by the applicant's agent, or sorry, the uh, concerned residence agent. I'm going to share my map. Zoom in. I'm this little. This one? Yeah. Apparently, Sheila's mother may know that I'm here, but she wasn't sure. So I'm just going to go with that little puzzle piece down there. That's where uh, Leo de Bever and Sheila McNally live just across from the Sheep River. Not far. Obviously, aside from the river issues and the environmental issues, you can see there also where the transportation issue becomes relevant. All right. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions, so I appreciate your uh, coming in to provide us with your comments, Mr. Atkins. So thank you very much. I did it for free. Okay. <laughs> That's good to hear. <laughs> Uh, next on my list, and I believe uh, they're online, is Britta Cummings. Britta, did you uh, would you like to unmute and provide council with any comment? Madam Reeve, I'll just let you know that Britta Cummings, Joe Shank, Scott Abbott, Matthew R. Pearson are with our landowner group. Okay, and I'm representing them today. And okay. Andrea Berg. No, no. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I will go to Andrea Berg, I believe. Uh, do we have Andrea online? I am here. Did you have any comment for council? If I could, sure. Certainly. Now is your chance. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, this has all been very good, informative information, so I appreciate that. I am the neighbor's just, I don't know if you want to point out after on the map, but the closest one to the actual ridge here, um, just south of the proposed area. My question was mainly for that stability um, aspect of it, just because our house is close to the ridge and with having our house so close to that. So that is good information that I've had there. Um, my second question was for just the wildlife corridor. We've only lived here for just over a year and a half. Um, I am also a realtor, so I understand the need to want to develop and build and sell all these um, lots for sure. Um, and would also, you know, love to be able to own that. Um, but for the wildlife, uh, how it goes as well, I'm just wondering if there is in fact the moose reserve and if that would be impacted in this area at all in the new proposed development area. Okay, um, uh, when the agent, when we come back to the agent for closing remarks, uh, she may choose to answer your question. Sure, great. Did you have anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no, I think everyone else has covered it so far, so thank you. All right, thank, thank you, you for your comments. comments. Uh, uh, next on my list, I have Jack and Mike Imler. Would you like to come forward and provide any comments for council? We'll okay. turn your mic on for you there, Jack. And... Yes, it's, it's on. There you go. Here we go. Uh, Councillors, brief, uh, good afternoon. Um, as a, everyone is well aware, uh, we're the operation with the cow. Okay. And uh, this goes back quite a ways, and it is not a confined feed operation. And first of all, Chris, uh, there's only a half section where she said there was 500 some acres, so her uh, information is incorrect. And uh, I will not disclose the amount of cows that are there. It's way more than a hundred, and she said there is uh, there's lots right now, but in the summertime there wasn't as many. Well, first of all, in the summertime there is absolutely zero, because they are gone to grass. 
and they, if she would like to know where they are at pads and grazing in a government grazing lease. So some of her information is wrong. And uh, I feel this uh, operation and would we get more and more people out there complaining, is there a manure problem and all that. But actually a few years ago, uh, environment, Alberta environment came out and checked everything and we we're doing everything properly and got a clean bill of health and it goes above the MD council when it becomes an L, uh, environmental issue, they send people from the Alberta government and there was no complaints and actually he told me we could have more cattle there if we wanted because it is not a confined feedlot. They are in pens right now when they're calving and they're close, and then they are out on the half section. And uh, the day the grass is green, those cows are long gone. But uh, we don't really need, that's our life, and we how we make our living. We don't need another uh, approximately 14 lots there and sure, they're gonna bring their dogs and dogs have a tendency and I'm sure everyone isn't gonna have them on a leash 24 seven. And that, uh, that's about all. And uh, like, and like they say, the highway, yes, they are gonna build uh, overpass and close off 370th. Uh, eventually that's a game plan, but I'm sure that's three to five years away. And then plus they'll have to upgrade 80th Street and that, and he's, uh, they said once uh, there'd be less traffic on 80th Street, they close off 370th. Uh, I would just like to know if they close 370th uh, intersection out, off, uh, they are going to have to take the overpass at 338, which would come down to 80th Street, and all that traffic would be coming right past our place. So where, where they say there's going to be less traffic, I disagree. There will be more on that road and that. So those are my concerns, and that's all I'd uh, have to say for now. Thank you, Mr. Emler. We do have a question for you, uh, Councillor Elder. Go ahead. Thanks, Madam Chair, and welcome, Mr. Emler. Nice to see you. <laughs> the I, I don't know, Mike. Are you planning to speak at all? My question's kind of for you, but I think Jack could probably answer this for me. So, uh, so the measurements that were taken from the corrals was basically in the north quarter in relation to the land that we're talking about, but also the South Quarter now, you have a selection of corrals and, and whatnot in, around Mike's yard? Yes. Correct? So Yes, to the north of his house. So there's so there's cattle in, that sit in that proximity to that yard also? Yes. Okay. Thank you for that. I'm just looking at an aerial map and it's, it's kind of not the same as what I've seen, but thanks for the clarity. That's all I have, Madam Chair. And and Mike, you're welcome to come forward if you like, please. Thank you, Council. Um, I just wanted to add to to Councillor Elder's um, measurement thing there. The measurement that is taken in her photo from 1,499 feet um, that is not uh, drainage pond, like that is an actual dugout. That's not wastewater drainage. Okay. That's uh, just for clarity. Um, you know, uh, Dad spoke to to what we do there. You know, um, so on and so forth. Um, my biggest concerns are are groundwater issues, and I think there's a lot of that going on in the MD the last four years with the drought. Um, you know, I I don't uh, don't really know if punching sixteen more wells in that area is is necessarily the best thing right now um 
groundwater tables are down. The study that they, they show us from 2017, a lot's changed, I believe, in, in the last, you know, especially the last four years. Um, my other areas, the biggest areas of concern are, are 80th Street and the, and the road crossings, right? In the summertime, uh, at least once a week, there's got to be an accident at 370 or 338. Um, you know, and we were told that the crossings, like those crossings were getting taken out which hasn't happened yet. I, I've heard rumblings that maybe this spring, maybe not. Um, you know, if in the meantime, when the overpass is being built, all that traffic has to go up 80th to 552 to the Oak Dope's overpass. Um, and I, I do not believe that 80th Street in its state right now or the Oak Dope's overpass will handle the traffic period once the, the highway medians are taken out. And I and I think adding extra to it is is obviously just going to be more detrimental. Um, those are our biggest concerns. Thank you. Okay. Councillor McHugh has a question for you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and she's the chair to the concerned applicant. Um, maybe can we just pull up? Uh, I guess my question would be: so there's livestock on your property, and and where is it located according to adjacent yes. to the uh, development? Okay, so my property is is directly north. Um, okay, so, so then I'm right there. All right. So the, the the pond that you can see in the middle, right there, where a cursor is, that that is an actual dugout. Like that's a freshwater dugout. That is not a any sort of uh, catch basin or whatsoever. Um, so that is you know right there. There is cattle. Out on that grass, you know, that's all grassland right there. So we could pretty much with except for the we have the debris, we have um the access road in between the properties, but other than the access road down to the river valley, the cows are immediately adjacent to the yeah. development. Yeah, like okay. the fences right fences right along the driveway. Thank you very kindly for that. And uh 80th Street, so you're aware, is kind of slated to be improved, hopefully, from 338th to the uh, to the north. But yeah, but could you speak to the condition of 80th Street from 338th south to 370? Um, yeah, it uh, 338 at the intersection of 338 and 80th has its own challenges um it, the, there's good and bad parts to it right um it's it's narrow it is narrow actually it's from our from my driveway which is the southern boundary of my quarter section there to uh the intersection of 338 and 80th is the narrowest part of 80th the power poles were moved across the, the road two winters ago in, ter in I guess in hopes of they were going to widen it and then the, and that that construction's never been done but I can speak like from the subject property to the south around the curve 80th is actually in pretty good shape but that's all been done before, like that's been re-widened in the past Hey, thank you very kindly for that. But so to summarize that, so basically the mile going north from the property up to 338 is is the what you described as as skinnier kind of road. Okay. And thank you very kindly. And that's all I had for you. Thank you. We do have another question for you. So we'll get you to hang on. Councillor Ole, go ahead. Sure. Just a really quick one. Thank you very much. You mentioned that you have a dugout in the center of the property to the north. Can you just tell me how how, yeah. how it was filled in 2023? And is there water in it now? Uh, there There is water in it right now. Yeah. It's runoff mostly from um, the, the crop fields and the pasture fields that kind of meet in the middle. That's the, that's the low spot. So does that indicate the water table is pretty good then? Um, no, I would say it, in 2023, it actually had very little water in it. It, it did fill up here a couple of weeks ago because of the, the, the runoff, um, just the way that it happened. I didn't actually think that we had that much snow, but it is full now. 
And that actually brings up something if on on um on the plan of this of this subject property, lots four and five were underwater two weeks ago. So where they have where they have on the north side, um those those lots were actually underwater. So it's just the way that the snow melted, the way that the water ran, um where you know where it had to go. Um there's two it's I, I wish it was easier to, to show you. Can, can you zoom in on that? Yeah, yeah. So if I put her cursor down right uh, can you guys see that where my character yeah. is? So there's a that's a tree bluff. There's a uh, if you kind of follow it through back to here where the water runs on the property to the west, there is water that runs across down through here, and then there's there's culvert across my driveway, across the breeze driveway, into the subject parcel, and then I believe there's a culvert on their driveway that leads to the existing house. And I, I believe that that's how it gets to the stormwater pond. Although I'm not, I, I'm, I don't know, I guess I don't know that for sure, but that's where the water ran a couple of weeks ago too. So those two lots that are sitting there, I, I believe it's five and six or four and five were, were underwater. Thanks for your answer. Um, and I just had a question. Can you tell me how you water your cattle? I, it's groundwater. It's it's so well. It's come from we've well. we've built cisterns. Okay. Yeah. So we have capacity to store the water. All right. So yeah. your water's uh normal average? It's actually down. down? It's been okay. down. Yeah. All right. Thanks for that. Councillor McHugh has one more question. Thank you, Madam Chair, and to the chair to the concerned resident. Just to uh expand a little bit on on that drainage you were describing that's the same drainage that comes from it's kind of a large drainage it comes all the way up from the intersection of 338th and 80th and then uh, that's a big culvert up there and that runs is that part of the same drainage you were just describing yeah so it runs it, right through the the bottom of uh it's section 36 there of wendy wilderman's it runs right through the bottom there and then you can see in that field where that dark spot is yeah that's what runs then under the highway uh under highway two and then of course over to um on the south side of 370th right so it just depends on how that water runs through there but it it can cut across uh right where the hand is there on the screen it it, it does if it's if it's going too fast it backs up and comes across coming to the east and then it comes under 80th. And then, of course, I think that's how it trails its way to stormwater pond. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I don't see any other questions for you. So thank you for coming forward. Oh, I'm sorry. Councillor Seward. <laughs> there he is. There. Go ahead, Councillor Seward. Uh, thank you, Madam Reeven. Sorry about the, the mix up. It's hard when you're online. Um, through the Reeve to Mr. Immler's. Um, our municipal development plan speaks quite extensively about uh, protecting agriculture, and I, you guys are kind of the the uh, one of the big egg, egg producers right in this area here. So, just wondering if if you could highlight for me. I know you did already a little bit, but um, how would this development, if it was approved, uh, affect your farming operation? Uh, the, the biggest the biggest effect to us would be the the extra people right next door, you know, right. Uh, right across the fence line from from our home operation like my dad jack spoke to you know our cows leave in the summertime they are only there for the winter but uh it basically would put you know uh, our cows in people's backyard okay thank you for that thank you i think that concludes all of our questions so thank you um, next on my list, I have online, do I have uh, David Casey? David, are you with us? Yes, he I just am. Left. Oh, oh, sorry. I do have to leave to go grab the kids from school, but I don't have any real questions. They're all pretty much being answered. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and then, then I have, have Cheyenne, Cheyenne Casey. Cheyenne. 
that's my wife. She's actually at work, so oh, okay. she's hoping to get the information from me, but I'm not sure how good that'll All right. be. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, on my list, I have John and Nancy DeVries. Did you have any comments for council? Thank you very much. Uh, Patrick Gilhurst. Patrick, are you here? Uh, we don't see him, but they were in support, apparently. And Wallace and Margaret Madsen. All right. Thank you very much. Anyone else in the gallery that I've missed that would like to come forward and provide counsel with any comments? I don't see any. So at this time, um, I'll go back to our agent and our applicant for your closing remarks, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, at this time, I'd like to address some of the concerns that were raised and then provide some closing remarks, if I may. Um, with regard to Mr. Aitken's representation of, of Mrs. Miss McNally, um, <laughs> To use the slopes as a comparison, if I was to do the slopes in Foothills County, it would never be approved. It's it's these are houses hanging off the side of a side hill in West Springbank that were then again resubdivided. There's just absolutely no comparison. And if we follow the breadcrumbs that were laid down by Mr. Aiken saying that Mother Nature should do her thing, then the slope should not exist. But it does, and this is what happens. Change happens, land use bylaws are enacted, rule books are, are made, and people make applications for development. And he was successful and good for him. I didn't hear any use value or enjoyment concerns by the McNallys. I heard no planning arguments. Um, I understand the issue with regard to 370th Avenue. However, Alberta Transportation provided no objection to this application and it is their jurisdiction in that highway. I don't know what they're doing with 370 or 338, if they'll have a right in or right out. The fact of the matter is if they close it, 80th Street is gonna be used by everyone on the east side, not just these residents. So it's a drop in the bucket compared to what is existing there today and be using 80th Street. Um, it's, it, it seemed, Mr. Aiken seemed to imply that we are developing on slopes and we are not developing on slopes. We are developing on the upland portion. We've done significant geotechnical work with regard to that upland development. There was a suggestion that <clears throat> septic fields weren't considered or were considered. I can't help it if an engineer looks at a raw water pipeline and thinks Okotoks is gonna service them. Get used to it. It's gonna happen every week. Someone's gonna come in and say, can I tap into that? They can't, we know that. But when engineers see that, they think, oh, they're gonna service, no, they're not getting service from Okotoks. I can't change an engineering report. I can certainly add some wisdom in terms of the method of servicing, which it does reflect. Um, as Mr. Uh, Mr. Aikens had asked for overland drainage needing some further requirement, we don't disagree. And that is why the stormwater management plan is at the land use stage as a condition of first. Um, additionally, I don't know if he, he, he realizes that private septic treatment systems tests are required on an individual lot basis at the subdivision stage. And my geotechnical recommendations will be provided to that engineer responsible for conducting those tests. So there is no um, slipping around or having septic systems in the setback area. All of this due diligence was done to understand how this could be properly developed. Um, I'll move on to uh, Mr. Imler, and I apologize for misspeaking. I have a lot of respect for Mr. Imler. I know him. I've known of him for many years. When I get nervous, I'm a massively dyslexic human being. And when I get nervous, I flip things. Uh, that was a, mis a misspeaking on my part. I'd be a doctor, not a planner, if I was good with numbers, and I'm not. Um, I do apologize. I did know the cows were there in winter, and I said summer, just out of nervousness, and I apologize. He is not a CFO. He, he said that. Um, there has been subdivisions done by the Imlers on the north side. There's three houses on the south side of this property. Um, they can't have subdivisions and complain about people complaining about manure and, and all the rest of it. 
Mr. Imler runs a classic, a classic operation. He's a good farmer. He has clean fields. That's evidenced. He's a good land manager. That's evidenced in the air photo. I'm trying to simply understand how we can co-manage um, this application with his use. And when people don't talk to me or shut me out of the engagement process, there's nothing I can do about it. So I made some, I, I, I did some investigating on my own. I, I tried to understand how the NRCB views these things. And I still feel we meet the minimum distance separation. The cows are in corrals on the north side of that house, not the south. Free running cows in a pasture are not considered a minimum separation distance um, applicable entity, but corrals and buildings are. Um, so, and I appreciate that um, he came and spoke to this. I wish he would have spoke to me. Um, <clears throat> Groundwater issues, I think council has given everyone the opportunity to prove water and we're asking for same. Um, and I talked about 80th Street and how everyone's gonna have to use it. Um, <clears throat> I did wanna address some of the letters. There is a letter from Mr. Richard and, and Miss Debbie DeVries. <laughs> One of the concerns was uh, harmful effects of light pollution and that there were no dark skies initiatives. Well. We have to follow the county's dark sky bylaw, which requires uh, dark sky compliant fixtures and our architectural controls will do the same. Uh, there's converse, there's uh, noise pollution considerations. Um, my understanding is that's what the community standards bylaw is for. Uh, it does allow for the operation of maintenance equipment within certain hours of the day. And if that's not happening, there is a procedure in place to bring some enforcement into the neighborhood. Um, there is some conversation about dogs and cats. There is a responsible dog ownership bylaw, which people need to follow, as well as the architectural controls that we would have in place with regard to dog enclosures. There is some cynicism that that does not work. However, it works very well in Hawks Landing, which is where we have it. And my my folks live there, and they are, their neighbors have their pigs in the in the dog enclosure. Their little small pigs. So it does it does work. Um, maintenance, burn maintenance, I've chatted about the environmental reserve and the municipal reserve I've chatted about. And, and really what I was trying to do with that MR is provide a connection as I'm required to do under the municipal government act. If council has different opinions on how that looks and wishes to follow Mr. Porter's direction, I have no objection. Um, and I could put that MR into private land, but I would not put a building envelope on it. Uh, we did note that the factor of safety for the house, which falls on the same slope as the municipal reserve, was over 1.3. It was, in fact, 2.2. Um, just going again uh, to some of the other letters, just make sure. Noise pollution, industry, burn maintenance. <clears throat> Dear. Oh, one of the questions that was raised by, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna find the name, Andrea Birch, was a wildlife corridor and a moose reserve. I have never heard of a moose reserve here. However, we are dedicating over 22 acres to environmental reserve and making a significant open space contribution. And our efforts are intended to protect the slope not invite people to it and not have trespassers on it. It is intended, intended to protect it and leave it in its natural state with all of the ground cover that's in place today. Um, I don't know what um, what wildlife corridor or, or moose reserve she was speaking of, nothing like that is formalized. Um, in conclusion, and I'll let Mr. Slocum make some concluding remarks as well. Um, we have tried as much as possible to engage residents and have conversations with them about this application and, and none of them chose to take advantage of that. Um, instead, uh, we are in this adversarial process, which is terrible and I dislike, but I'll talk to anyone if they'll talk to me. Um, I respect and understand these concerns. I've been dealing with this property for eight years now. Uh, and I'm really just trying to do my best by what the landowner clients are wishing and what the adjacent landowners are wishing. And I'm trying to find a middle ground. And with this application, I 
every intent of doing that. And I believe I've done that successfully. So it's really up to counsel at this point, if you believe that I have done enough uh, to convince you that this application should proceed. Um, Mr. Slocum, I'm gonna ask if you have anything you'd like to add. Uh, thank you, Madam Reeve, for this opportunity and counsel. Uh, my hope is that uh, enough information has been provided to, to build a foundation here so that there's obviously some conditions that will need to be in place. There's some things we still need to figure out. We need to figure out what the water looks like. We need to know what the traffic impact assessment is. My hope is that you know we we've laid that foundation that we will we've opened up a conversation with our neighbors and that that council can find the conditions um, that would be appropriate here and, and gives us an opportunity to uh, prove our application even better. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Reef. Thank you. Planning well, Officer DiMaggio, any closing remarks? I have nothing further, thank you. Back to council and administration for any questions. Councillor McHugh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through the chair to the applicant, the drainage water from the three spring thaws we've had so far this year, how does it get to the river from your property at this point? I'm going to ask Mr. Slocum to answer that since he lives there. That's why I asked him. Oh, thank you. I, I'm not a, a specialist in any way, uh, uh, Madam Reeve, to the Councillor McHugh, um, but generally the water absorbs into the ground is my observation. Water was not uh, flowing into the storm pond. Uh, we have already started taking measures to you know, fill that in. Um, there was a, a pipe that went from the north field where the, the little pond that we've had in the last few days has been uh, into the southern field. Uh, I'm not sure if, if there's some clogging up there or, or not, um, but usually it flows into the south field and and through the ground to there. We don't have any sort of floodways or, or uh, swamping uh, in any part from our experience in the last seven years. But that answers the question. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I don't see any. So I will uh, close the hearing at this time. Should you wish to view council's deliberations, you're welcome to watch uh, the live stream meeting with the link found on the county's website at any time or uh, a decision will be sent to you once next week's minutes have been ratified, or you're welcome to remain in the gallery. I'm just not sure when council will be discussing this application. So with that, I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to come in today and provide us with your comments and remarks. And with that, I wish you a great rest of your day and a happy Easter. Thank you. So we'll take a few minutes here. Quick break.
130 hearing for 2388088 Alberta. Um, I'll start uh, the conversation. Uh, we'll open the floor and go to the councillor of the area. Councillor McHugh, would you like to start us off? Perhaps we could shut the back door there if you wouldn't mind, Manager Eva Kingbury. Thank you. Go ahead, oh. Councillor McHugh, if you're so inclined. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through the chair to the floor. Um, I want to start with the Central District. I find it extremely annoying that the Central District is a black line drawn along a river. Um, it's always been a fallacy to me. That's where it lies, but it does not show the intent of giving... Uh, respect to riparian areas is it's drawn right on the river. Secondly, it's right at a pinch point, um, kind of to the north in the central district, we get up to division six and it's expected that we will see residential pressures. Uh, the central district at that pitch point then goes further south to bring in our industrial corridor which kind of leaves this area I would describe as at the southernmost extremities of residential development area, if that's what you consider growth. So my point is it is right on the line, it is right on the line of a river and uh, becomes very difficult for me to say that is included in the residential growth area and or the industrial district growth area. So when we look at the surrounding area, and I don't know if we want to throw up a map or not, directly at the intersection of 80th Street and 338th to the northeast, there is a development in that corner that is, I could guess you could say is cluster residential. From that point down south, basically we have some CR parcels, mostly mostly one-offs. Uh, at the bottom end of the title in question, we do have two smaller ones. Never did understand those. Point being, there is a minor to moderate CR use in the immediate vicinity by... Uh, virtue of landholders in this area, uh, including uh, some of the concerned residents that were here today, the predominant use in this area is agriculture and not CR. Uh, so the residential section of the MVP 2010 provides that residential parcels should be developed to be compatible with the surrounding area and existing uses. And I think that's pretty clear today that this uh, level of development is not compatible with the existing uses in the area. Further to that, uh, if there was to be any consideration whatsoever for proceeding with this, 80th Street from 338, four mile down to the development, I would expect to be completely built out to a uh, chip seal standard, eight meter top, yellow line divided at the cost of the developer to acquire all of the right of way and easements for that mile to get that mile to a 30 meter standard. This area with the 370th probably ends up being a uh, right in, right out. Uh, so I know this from personal experience that is the route that all your farm traffic takes as soon as they get across the sheep river they turn right and they jump on there to get off of the highway so it's the main thoroughfare corridor for all our farm traffic and i'll just start there thanks all right anyone else <laughs> Councillor Alter, go ahead. Not a lot of takers. 
It's a bit of a tough one. I'm I'm uh, kind of sitting on this one. Uh, I've got some mm -hmm. uh, definitely got some concerns, but uh, I've also got some. Uh, I think the application was done in uh, in good faith with uh, the concerns of the neighbors. Uh, again, this density in this area, I'm kind of inclined to agree with Mr. McHugh. Is it is it warranted? You know, when we when we see these applications and we see 14 lots, it's like, oh, 14 lots, 14 homes are going to get dropped into this land. This land is probably going to take 10 years to develop. So when we're talking about the road infrastructure that's going to happen on either 80th Street, uh, don't know the timeline on that. The overpass, we don't know the timeline on that. But in the meantime, we're still going to be, as the development progresses we're still going to be asking people to be crossing this highway and, and getting onto this road and uh, adding to the traffic of the area through the development and then of course to the actual people living in the homes there so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of torn I'm, I'm mostly torn about the density and the amount of people that are going to be next to an intensive livestock operation let's let's call it what it is uh even though it's maybe not registered as that it is that in the winter time there's no question about it and there's uh going to be a lot more people a lot more animals and a lot more uh concerns for the uh for the farmers in the area plus the uh, uh plus the saskatoon farm there which is is to the northeast kitty corner um yeah just opening comments for now. I'm 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 really fence sitting on this. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to by comment? Councillor Ole, go ahead. Sure. Thank you. I thought it was a very thoughtful application, and they had uh, reworked and revisited a lot of the concerns that came forward previously. I guess my concern is similar in that I'm not sure about the number of lots, the density part of it, but I do feel like they've done the homework to help us be able to push that back and, and be respectful. Uh, I'm just not sure how you keep anyone out of the river Valley when you have people living on the, on the escarpment or on the top um, uh, plains on the top that a line between two lots or a municipal reserve, I don't think any of those can hold them back, but I suppose you can fence it and put a sign up or something like that. So I'm just not sure if that's going to work. There may be some other strategy that could be used on that. And maybe we don't need any access to it. I don't know if it's really necessary for us to have access to it. So I guess if we do have ER, it's been requested by staff, maybe that needs some rethinking. Other than that, I... I believe the the studies were done and they were done by reliable uh, specialists, by re reliable professionals. And I guess the question for us is, uh, it could be a complete refusal or it could be perhaps a, a, a redirect for, for less lots. We also have the business application as a site-specific amendment before us, which I have no problem with doing a bed and breakfast in that area it was something that was approved and they would like to try to get that working again. And now they've applied for it on a five acre parcel instead of the full parcel. So I'm not sure maybe that's a planning question. Would that be able to be approved on its own or is that really contingent on this application moving forward with the re designation to the country residential as a site specific to the country residential? Thanks for that. Uh, Director Hemingway, do you want to weigh in on that site-specific amendment piece here? It's certainly possible for council to um, grant first reading on a bylaw that supports a site-specific amendment um, to allow for two additional units versus the four units in a bed and breakfast to allow for six units in a bed and breakfast. But the application before you is for rezoning. So we currently are in a direct control district. So we would need to rezone this property if council's not supported of creating additional lots. Like I'm, I just want to wait to see how you're going to get to a decision on the end, and then I'll guide you on the site specific because, um, you know, currently this is a direct control zoning. If you do no lots, it would go to an agricultural land use district, which is different from a country resident. So I just I need to know where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> before I can answer that question, but I'm confident there's a way to do it. I think we don't know where we're going. 
<laughs> but we'll get there. Councillor Roll, did you have more? Yeah, I guess I just want to, I just really want to recognize the thoughtfulness of the application. And I really, you know, we all read all of the concerns and all of the other things as well. And I believe this area is going to develop. I'm just not sure how quickly. And so if it was perhaps less dense of a development, it may fit more and there'd be less concerns. So again, I'm, I'm doing much like the other counselor who had just spoke, counselor elders, I'm on the fence, just waiting to hear more information as to the appropriateness of the scale for the location and what the future holds for this application. And, and obviously this is a, a threshold type of application for the area being in the central district. What does that mean with our decision here today? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Castell. Thank you, Madam Reith. I'm looking at the public works comment about um, five meters for future road widening. Will this road handle all the traffic for developing homes and, and uh, big trucks coming in and everything? How's, how's that gonna work right now when the road isn't wider? And you're gonna have the traffic with um, cement trucks you're going to have everything coming down there and, and i i they didn't comment on that so i i'm assuming they don't see a problem but i kind of have a concern that the road isn't ready for this i um, believe the applicant spoke to doing a traffic impact assessment if i'm not okay. correct okay deputy reed waldorf Thank you, Madam Chair, and through the chair to the floor. Significant change and, and um, Councilor Roll's suggestion, lots of thought has gone into it, I think aimed at dealing with some of the past and previous concerns that, uh, that were evident. Some of the concerns, proof of water, the traffic assessment review can be dealt with at future steps. You know, I wonder, we hear it all the time, and I'll take the livestock operation as an example. It's an existing operation and it's there. All of a sudden new residents come in and I guess they were aware that it's there and then all of a sudden the complaints start. So I, I don't know how you deal with that, but um, that's just reality. And it's not particular to this, this application. It happens all the time. The border of the central district, there was a an application, an area structure plan application that came to council a year ago, February. And one of the concerns from one of the uh, participants, uh, concerned citizens was it's right on the border of the central area. And uh, again, you know, it's, it's a tough one. If you take a 20,000 foot view and you look from the city of Calgary limits, and I think um, Councillor McHugh was, was illustrating the central district, this is where it's happening, and do we do we fault it because it's you know kind of right on the edge? Uh, there's the industrial area is going. We now have an economic development advisory uh, committee. Things are going to start happening there, and uh, yeah, it's going to grow. And and the comment about 14 homes dropping in overnight, it's not going to happen. Yeah, this is a long term long term project. So while I'm on the fence, I'm kind of leaning to supporting more just because of the um the, pl the plan that's been presented to us taken into consideration uh the operations and neighbors in the past and really looking long term uh, down the road and uh that's all i have right now thank you thank you and anyone else uh councillor McHugh? oh i'm sorry councillor seward i see you yeah i see them both okay thanks madam reeve um, yeah, I share many of the same concerns as Councillor McHugh has. This is a, a very busy area in terms of agriculture. There's a lot of stuff going on, um, a lot of intensive farming operations here. Our municipal development plan is really focused on the protection of agriculture throughout the entire area, not just outside of the central district, but the entire entirety of it. And you know, the wording of it is quite specific in that it says council may approve a subdivision if it does not negatively affect uh, local agricultural production. And this, there's no way that we could say that this will not negatively and significantly impact agriculture in the area here. There is no 
livestock operator who would ever want 14 homes right breathing down their neck. It's a, a recipe for complaints. It's a recipe for disaster. And um, to approve a subdivision like this would just be putting another nail in the coffin for uh, forcing agriculture out of the area. And I, I just can't support that. So I can't support this um, application before us today. Thanks. Um, municipal manager, Reva Kane. Right. Mike scares me now. Oh, there we go. No, no reverberation. Uh, I would mention that uh, 80th Street, of course, uh, we have done the preliminary design for the reconstruction of 80th. And uh, this portion, uh, although we have done the engineering, was uh, put on hold uh, pending the closures of the intersections, knowing uh, what uh, was going to proceed. So right now we're concentrating on 338th North to Secondary Highway 552. Uh, but as I say, we already have done uh, the engineering for reconstruction of this section of 80th as well. Thank you for that, Councillor McHugh. Okay, Councillor Castell. Thank you, Madam Reeve, and to Manager Reva Cameron. So you anticipate this road not being fixed until after 3.38 is in? Now knowing what um, that there will be an overpass at 3.38 and 3.70th and 306 will be closed, uh, it would uh, reduce the priority on this section of of the road because it'll only be uh, local traffic, uh, you know, traffic uh, from um, the south end from 370th north, but no traffic from Highway 2 coming on to it. But south of south of the air, the area where we're talking, that road won't be fixed. Uh, and that depends on um, you know the level of activity there in the future. So as of as of right now. Uh, that section of road uh, is uh, needs to be rebuilt in order to maintain the surface on it. So in your estimation, can it handle a lot of construction vehicles going up and down, putting this whole development? I'm putting you on the spot. I won't. No, it's okay. You put me on the spot. The council determined that this section of the road cannot handle the traffic that's presently on it. But a lot of that traffic comes from Highway 2. So if you eliminate the traffic from Highway 2 in the future by closing the intersection at 370th, then uh, it changes the amount of traffic on this section of the road. And so we would have to reassess whether it can uh, withstand uh, you know, the amount of traffic. So the TIA that's recommended would probably give you the answers to that. Thank you. Councillor McHugh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through the chair to the floor. I don't think that I, my final comment, I'm just going to reiterate that. Well, it's probably not my final comment. I'm going to reiterate when you come across any agriculture producer that comes across your sheep uh, on Highway 2, get to 370th, you turn right so to get off of the highway. So if they close the medians, it's still right in, right out. Um, so there's that aspect. Uh, the predominant use in this area is agriculture. There is a minor to moderate CR use in the area. Uh, but it does remain primarily agriculture. Uh, I don't want to get into the specifics with names of farm operators in the area that use that road for access to gain access going north, but it is required because of the Sheep River, and uh, it, that's that's the way you got to go. Um
I think that Councillor Seward's statements summed it up best. Will this area potentially grow in the future? Potentially. Uh, that's that's speculation. It's uh, kind of a tough one. I don't know what to say with the the options we have here for a motion are a little bit. Uh, so I'm working on the option for refusal, and I don't know. I'm not seeing. We can come back to you, Councillor McHugh. Well, no, I'm giving you the option for refusal. Oh, okay. Uh, the balance, yeah, sorry. Please go ahead in regards to the site-specific amendment. Yeah, Thanks. I I have I have a thought. If Council's interested in refusing the application, my recommendation or suggestion, if you're still supportive of allowing for the site-specific amendment to increase the number of sleeping units in a bed and breakfast as applied for, just so you know, it's a discretionary use to have four units sleeping units in a bed and breakfast and that's both under country residential and agriculture the application would like to do six sleeping units so that's where the site specific comes in so council's not interested in supporting the multi-lot subdivision but interested in supporting the site specific amendment my recommendation would be to allow for the redesignation from dc3 to agriculture district and to allow for the development of a six unit bed and breakfast as a discretionary use Okay. Sorry, is it currently at four? Um, currently, it's a discretionary use under agriculture and country residential to apply for a bed and breakfast with four four, four yeah. sleeping units. Right, right, Brittany. Am I right on that? Yeah. And they want six. I believe they would like six. Now they may not proceed. That may not be their ultimate goal. Um, however, if if council is considering um, supporting that aspect of the application and not supporting the multi-lot subdivision, then that's my recommendation. Well, I struggle a little bit with going from four to six, but I think I guess I guess I would uh, I guess I would go with uh, the refusal option here and acknowledge the site-specific amendment to go to six. Uh, just speaking further to this motion, I didn't take this into consideration. Now I can't remember if in this application, if the development went through, if the uh, uh, if the request was to keep the bed and breakfast happening. That it just was. adds to, it was. Okay, so that just adds to further traffic. So once again, the road infrastructure does not support the development, not even close. Um I do still have outlying questions as to how we develop these lots in the stormwater plan. I know they would submit a stormwater plan, but somehow on this 72 acres, 73 acres of very good productive agricultural land, I'm, I'm struggling to understand how you're going to keep all of the stormwater confined on a three acre parcel and still have a building area. This water has to go somewhere. It's really evident when you look at the air photo that immediately below the MR is a landslide, but the geotech somehow comes up with a 1.1 rating. So I don't know what that means. I guess double that means it's only, you know, it, you get these, it, it just boggles my mind. There's a landslide right there, but it still gets a geotechnical rating 1.1. <laughs> um, and that's all I have. Thanks. Director Hemingway, did you want to go next? And then we'll go to Councillor. Yeah, just one more point of <clears throat> clarification. The existing land use on the parcel does allow for a bed and breakfast. It's a direct control yeah. application. So you know, council could simply refuse the application and the applicant can make a development permit for a, um, a bed and breakfast. Even for six units, it's a council decision. It will come to you as a council decision. So it's got this strange land use on it, DC3, that would allow for that. Yeah. Councillor, go ahead. Sure, I would be supportive of staying with the land use as we 
saw this application and were refusing the country residential. So I'd be in favor of staying with it. And if they want to change it in the future, that would be up to them. So again, if this is a development permit application, even if we're in favor of it moving forward, it has to come back as a direct control to council. So, and you can even have a public meeting if you want. So it's up to you if you wanted to do that and stay with, so you're, you're refusing it straight up and, and they can come back in with a, with an application just because it's in the land use. They don't even, we don't even have to talk site specific amendment then. So it's just a straight up refusal then. So that's, so I'm understanding it's just a refusal, not, we're not worrying about the site specific at all then. Okay. Thank you. And then just under this land use, they have the opportunity. Thank you. Um, Director Hemingway, I just had a couple of questions uh, and comments. Um, can you speak to me? I know we've brought this up at other applications uh, with lots, more than eight lots, uh, and we've looked at communal water systems. Would this be a candidate for that? Um, I would defer to the Public Works Department, but we have requested studies uh, that give us some idea, and they may be slightly out of date. They were done in 2018. That suggests that you need over 50 units okay. com com all working towards um, paying for the costs of maintenance and testing on a communal water system and require capital reserves on top of that, or or we can guarantee it'll simply be handed to us. It's not a sustainable, it's financially sustainable operation on a communal well system under 50 units. Um, and more more units, even that is, is desirable. Um, and that's probably a study that we should redo because capital costs and the, and the cost of the testing has increased significantly since that time. Yeah, thanks. So, um, I guess I'll weigh in because this is the crux of what our council has to look at. Um, this is the central growth area. It's been identified in our municipal development plan as an area where we expect to see growth, where we would support growth as a council, where it made sense. Um, this council and this municipality is under increasing pressures and I don't need to tell my colleagues that uh, because we have a major metropolis directly to the north of us and so we find that residents are spilling out um, into the county and um, and we are grateful for our acreage uh, development that come to the county they provide a lot of um, a lot of income to us as well the problem we have is trying to balance this growth, balance the the acreage and the uh, the growth of and our population with our existing agricultural um, producers in the area, and it's becoming harder and harder to try and uh, and and balance that as a council. And the pressure uh, is on us to uh, to find areas that are appropriate for, uh, for development. Not everyone uh, likes the development and some people uh, obviously love the development because they come to Foothills County for that quality of life, uh, for that um, uh, release to get away from, from city life. So for us, uh, we're tasked with uh, trying to find uh, areas that fit with that. Um, I don't view the Emler's um, uh, uh, operation as an intensive livestock operation. Believe me, I know what an intensive livestock operation is. I have a pretty contentious one in my area. So, um, but to try and coexist uh, with a with a livestock operation that you know is directly to the north of it is a challenge for sure. Um, I may have uh, looked at this and and uh, could be more favorable if uh, we had an HOA perhaps in place. It may help um, to have those restrictions with a community association where we can go to them or you could, the planner or the developer could say, we will institute dark sky, we will clamp down on noise. We will have uh, architectural controls. We will have dogs that 
you know, no dogs running at large. Um, you know, we, if we had some controls on watering and then the, the river Valley, um, residents walking down into that, perhaps a, a homeowners association could limit the use of that to the, to the homeowners in the area. So there's lots of things I think that would benefit, uh, this development if, if there were some type of association there, and I know full well council can't impose any of that and we can't regulate it. But um, I feel in other areas in Heritage Point, it certainly helps to have those in place. And it gives some of the neighboring landowners some comfort that there will be some controls there. Uh, I also look at this is not 14 lots going in tomorrow. This will take time. And... Uh, and I think development in this area is is imminent. Is this the right time? Um, you know, we we can only look as a council on on applications as they come in. We don't out at, go out actively and and uh, look for development. It uh, it comes to us. So um, those are my comments uh, on this application. Uh, I do see growth directly around it. It is a short distance from Okotoks. We will not be getting water from Okotoks, so let's be clear on that or any other type of servicing for this development. I would hope that uh, the intersections would get closed. We had that promise and then um, Alberta Transportation reversed that decision. I'm not sure it's the right decision for the area. Um, I would have liked to seen uh, at least two of those closed to help with the traffic, because we all know it's it puts a lot of pressure on this area. So those are my comments for now. Um, I'll go to you, Councillor Castell. Thank you, Madam Reith. Um, I do support Councillor McHugh's motion. Um, I agree this will develop eventually, but I, I have a lot of concerns that this is just a little premature. Um, I, I understand there'll be a, a traffic impact, but given that it's so narrow now, it it would have to be done immediately to support all this that's going in. So those are my comments. Thank you. Councillor yeah. McHugh. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Through the chair to the floor, let's get a the street built. Um, just parliamentary inquiry, where am I with this motion then? I did have the, are we considering um, a friendly suggestion here to take the site-specific amendment off? I don't believe it was, it's just straight. Okay, so the motion standing on the floor for clarity is a straight refusal. Thanks. Option two. Okay, on page 59, anyone else with any comments or remarks on this application? I don't see any, so we'll call the vote. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Always uh, very tough decisions for council to make, and I appreciate uh, all the um, all the comments and remarks. Thank you, everyone. So let's move on, council. Um, I believe uh, we had a few more uh, people to speak in open session. Um, we'll go back to you, Manager Reva Cambrin, and uh, you had some more things in open session for us. Please go ahead. Well, I, I did want to give council an update on uh, some of the staffing uh, situations and in public works and uh, good news uh, we we have hired a mechanic and uh, an apprentice mechanic so we have one more to go um, so that's the good news um, I guess the bad news is uh, one of our foremen uh, Mr. Harper after 30 plus years is uh, retiring and so he'll be uh, done May May 7th, I think, will be the date. And uh, so uh, and that'll be a, 
a big change, especially during snow season. But uh, we also had another of our foremen uh, move on to private industry. And so uh, that uh, leaves us in a bit of a, a bit of a bind out there. And uh, so we'll be, as recruiting has just been awful. <laughs> uh, our HR department is just under siege right now. So uh, anyway, that's uh, that's kind of uh, the update there. And the only other item I had was enclosed. All right. Um, CAO Payne, anything in open? Yeah, very quickly for council. Just in terms of meetings, I did have one prior to RMA convention on March 14th with Mr. Drew Chipman from Foothill School Division regarding the Blackie School and the community hub and user groups there um, regarding that agreement that we had discussed previously. And council will note that's an item that is on the agenda for closed session today, um, speaking specifically to that agreement itself. Uh, also met with the new CAO in Diamond Valley on March 15th uh, about a number of sort of mutual items. Uh, the two real priority items at this point that he and I discussed, one is the intermunicipal collaborative framework that's required by the end of this year. Um, the intent there is really to take a similar template to what we have in place with the town of Okotoks and the town of High River for a master shared service agreement. Um, so updating our current agreements into a new format, a little bit modernized formula and something administratively uh, easier to deal with and then using that as our ICF. But to get there, we also do need to set up a interim municipal committee with Diamond Valley now that they are amalgamated and moving forward. I know there was a terms of reference, I believe that council may have seen um, in the years past when it was being considered between ourselves, Black Diamond and Turner Valley. Uh, but I know uh, an administrator from Diamond Valley has connected with uh, Director Hemingway. And I think Director Hemingway has passed it on to Legislative Services Manager Barrett uh, to take a look at the framework for that terms of reference. So I'm telling you this so that you're aware that there is something that will be coming to you looking to set up and formalize an IMC with Diamond Valley so we can discuss mutual items of mutual interest. And one of the top priorities for us will be to meet the timeline on the ICF, which again is due for the end of this year. So quite a bit of work to be done on that. Um, also attended the spring convention that was already well reported. Joint Health and Safety Committee meeting. Uh, that was a good meeting. Uh, there's sort of a new framework that'll be coming to that committee in the near future regarding uh, job hazard assessments and a formalized standard that connects the joint, connects the hazard assessment to the SOPs and to the job descriptions um, and really simplifies for staff expectations around our safety program. And that will end up landing on council's table once it's been to the Joint Health and Safety Committee as well, because there is a, a revised policy that's being proposed to um, really create some continuity across the organization as to how we manage our safety program and our joint hazard assessment requirements. Uh, Okotoks IMC meeting was already reported. Uh, one other note for council, there was a response that was provided by Minister McIver to a letter from the Reeve regarding the dispute resolution bylaw that CMRB was considering and um, its incongruence with really what the minister's request was. And he acknowledged the county's opinion and uh, indicated that his staff is currently reviewing the bylaw and there would be more to come. So when that more to come shows up, we'll, we'll have another discussion with council at that point. And I'll just stop there, Madam Reef. Hey, Manager Barrett, anything from you? I have nothing for council today. Thank you. Okay, we'll take a motion to go into close and try to deal with our items. Councillor Alder, all in favor? Motion carries.
Welcome back, Foothills County. We have uh, completed our agenda for today. Our next meeting will be April 3rd, 2024. Um, oh, and we do have, sorry, we do have a couple of motions. Deputy Rewalder, go ahead. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I move to support the IMC recommendation on Champion Park with concurrence from Okotoks Town Council. Thank you. Any um, other comments on this motion? Call the vote, all in favor. Motion carries. Did we have any other motions? Oh, the Maven strategy to use, uh, to use that strategic company for our strategic session. Who would like to make that motion? Um, Councillor, who would like to make it? Let's go home. Okay. <laughs> so moved. Thank you. I'll have, I don't think we need to discuss it any further. All in favor? Thank you. Motion carries. Is that all we have? Are we complete? Good. Okay. With that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Councillor Castell, all in favor? We are adjourned at six o'clock. Good job. See you all next week.